Chapter 122 of Varney the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 122 Mrs. Williams visits the Bannerworths at the inn. The marriage of James Anderson with Helen. Let us fancy now, after all these singular circumstances had taken place, the Bannerworth family, with James Anderson and Helen Williams, seated in a comfortable room at the inn at Anderbury, where they had put up when they came to that place, in pursuance of the invitation they had received from Mrs. Williams. And that lady, probably could she have foreseen what was about to occur, would have taken most especial pains to prevent such an invitation from ever reaching such a destination but she had fallen a victim to her own love of display, and not being content with inviting people whom she did know, she must forsooth give them a carte blanche to bring with them people whom she did not know at all. And this it was that she had been horrified by what had taken place, and had had all her brightest visions of the future leveled with the dust. When Jack Pringle told Mrs. Williams that he believed she would quite willingly have sold her daughter to a vampire, he was right for she would have done so, always provided that the vampire, as aforesaid, had a good property, and was able to convince her of that most important fact. The only person of all the little party that was assembled at the inn, who looked pale and anxious, was poor Helen, and she certainly did look so, for when we come to consider her novel position we shall not wonder at it. She had thrown herself completely upon the consideration of strangers, and was severed from all those natural ties which ought to have for ever held her in their gentle bondage. But this conduct, or rather the conduct of that one who ought to have protected her through all trouble and anxieties, her mother, had been such as to deprive her of the feeling that she had a home at all. Flora saw that her guest, as indeed she considered Helen, looked sad and dejected and she made every effort within her power to rescue her from such a state of things. "'Do not despair of much happiness,' she whispered to her, "'but rather thank good fortune, which, at the last moment, rescued you from one whom you could not love. Be assured that now you will enjoy the protection of those who will soon be able to prevail upon your mother to look with a favorable eye upon any new arrangement.' "'I am very much beholden to you,' said Helen, "'very much beholden to you,' and I feel that I ought to congratulate myself upon my escape. But my heart does feel sad, because the state of things, to avoid which I made myself a sacrifice, may now ensue in all their terrors. My dear, said the Admiral, who overheard her, don't you believe any such rubbish as all that? I have no doubt you have been regularly persecuted into the match with the supposed Baron, and you would, perhaps, have found out afterwards that one half of the things you were told to induce you to consent had no foundation but in somebody's active imagination. Do you think so, sir? Do I think so? To be sure I do. Now, I dare say you were told how, if you married the Baron What's-His-Name, you would be doing something wonderful for all your family. Yes, yes. Oh, of course, I can see through all that clearly enough, and I tell you, my lass, that you have had a most fortunate escape, and that there is, and shall be, no reason on the face of the earth why you should not be married to the man of your choice. He has been to sea, and so, of course, he has finished what may be called his education. If he had been on shore all his life, you might have doubted about the prudence of having him, but, as it is, it's quite another matter. "'Sir, I thank you for your kind advocacy of my cause,' said James Anderson, "'and I shall ever consider, as one of the most fortunate accidents of my life, the meeting with Admiral Bell. Oh, don't say anything about that. I know some of the people at the Admiralty, and when you go to make the report of how you have been shipwrecked, and how you lost your dispatches, I will give you a letter of introduction, which, I dare say, won't do you any harm. Indeed, sir, this is more kindness than I ought to expect. Not at all, my boy, not at all. Don't put yourself out of the way about it. Only I tell you what I would do. You need not take my advice unless you like. But if I were you, I'd be hanged if I moved an inch anywhere till I made Helen Williams my wife. Can you suppose, cried James Anderson, while his eyes sparkled with delight, can you suppose, my dear sir, that such advice could be other than most welcome to me? And what do you say, Helen, to it? whispered Flora. What can I say? You can say yes, I suppose, said the Admiral. Helen was silent. Very good, added the Admiral. When a girl doesn't say no, of course she means yes. 
"'And you can make sure of your prize now you have got her, Master Anderson. "'Let's see. You manage these affairs with what you call a special license, don't you?' "'Yes, Uncle,' said Flora. "'That is the way. "'You seem to know all about it, and I almost suspect you really must have had some experience in these matters.' "'I experience, you little gypsy? What do you mean? "'I never was married in all my life, and I don't intend to be. "'Don't make too sure, Uncle, but despite all that, "'no one could more warmly second your advice to Mr. Anderson than myself. "'Very good. For that speech I forgive you. "'And now, Mr. Anderson, just come along with me, "'for I want to say a few words to you which nobody else has anything to do with.' "'When the Admiral got James Anderson alone, he said to him, "'Of course you are without funds, so it's no use making any fuss of delicacy about it. I have no doubt but that, with my interest, I shall be able to get you into an appointment of some sort, but in the meantime I beg that you will not cross me in my desire to serve you. In mind, I take your word of honor to repay me, so, you see, there is no obligation. Sir, this noble generosity, there, there, that's quite enough, for the fact is, it ain't noble generosity at all, so hold your tongue about it, and be so good as to let me consider that as settled. Here are fifty pounds for you, which will enable you to go to London like a gentleman, and to conduct your marriage either here or there, as you may yourself think proper, and as your bride may consent. Sir, I would fain make Helen my own here. Very good. I don't pretend to understand how to manage these things, but set about it as quickly as you can, and don't be deterred by anybody. This short, but to James Anderson, deeply interesting conversation, because it relieved his mind from a load of anxiety, took place a few paces from the inn door only, so that they returned at once, but scarcely had they joined the rest of the party, and were considering what they should order for dinner, when one of the waiters of the establishment came to say, "'If you please, there's a lady who wants to come in. I asked her her name, but she won't give it. But she says she must see everybody.' "'The deuce she must!' cried the Admiral. "'What sort of a craft is she?' "'Sort of a what, sir?' "'My fears tell me,' sobbed Helen, "'that it is my mother.' The Admiral whistled, and then he said, I suppose we shall have a breeze, but the sooner it's over the better. Let the lady come in, and don't you be afraid of anything, my lass. Why, you look as pale as if you expected. Here she is. The door was flung open, and Mrs. Williams made her appearance. Anger was upon her face, and it required but a small amount of penetration to perceive that she came fully charged with all sorts of reproaches. Helen trembled and shrunk back, for she had an habitual fear of her mother which the imperious conduct of that individual had induced in the mind of so gentle a creature as Helen from her very childhood. "'Well, madam,' said Henry, stepping forward, "'to what are we indebted for the honour of this visit from one who has not the courtesy to wait for an invitation?' "'Oh, I expected this,' said Mrs. Williams, with a shivering toss of her head. "'I quite expected this, I can assure you, of course. But I'll pretty soon let you know, sir, what I came about. I have come for my daughter, sir. What have you to say against that?' "'Nothing, madam, if your daughter chooses to comply with your request.' "'Helen!' screamed Mrs. Williams. "'Helen! I command you to come home this moment!' "'Mother, hear me!' said Helen. "'Consent to my happiness with one whom I can love, "'with the same readiness that you would have seen me the bride of one "'for whom I never could hope to feel anything in the shape of affection, "'and I will accompany you home at once.' "'Oh, dear, yes, of course. Consent to ruin, consent to nonsense, consent to your marrying a scapegrace who cannot even keep himself, far less a wife. No, Helen, you cannot expect that I should ever consent to your marrying such a poor wretch.' "'But don't you think,' said Henry, "'that any poor wretch is better than a vampire?' "'No, I do not.' "'Oh, very good, then,' said the Admiral. "'If that's the lady's opinion, what can we say to her? And as for commanding Miss Helen here to go home, I command her to stay.' "'You command her?' "'Yes, to be sure. Ain't I an admiral? What have you got to say against that? I should like to know. I shall take good care that James Anderson is no poor wretch by getting him some good appointment, and as your daughter is of age, old girl, and so can choose for herself, you may as well weigh anchor and be off at once, for nobody wants to be bothered with you. Do you mean to say that you are a real admiral, and have nothing to do with the horse marines? Nothing whatever, ma'am. Good day to you. We are all waiting for our dinners, and don't feel disposed to talk any more, so be off with you.' Mrs. Williams seemed to be considering for a moment, and then she said, "'Oh, gracious, a, a mother's feelings must always be excused. I almost think that, just to please you, Admiral, I will consent.' "'You will, mother?' exclaimed Helen. "'Why, in a manner of speaking,' said Mrs. Williams, "'I should not mind, but it's quite, you see, a dreadful thing to think of, when we consider what an expense I have gone to in all these matters, and that I have not had so much as one farthing from the Baron, although he did say he would pay all the cost I might be put to.' 
"'From resources which, in course of time, industry may procure me,' said James Anderson eagerly, "'you shall be repaid all that you can possibly say has been expended for Helen.' "'Ah, well then, if Admiral Bell here will say that he will see me paid, I consent.' "'Very well,' said the Admiral. "'I'll see you paid. "'If you had acted generously in the matter, you should have been a gainer. "'But as it is, you shall be paid, and we decline your acquaintance.' Mrs. Williams began, from the tone and manner of her daughter's new friends, to suspect that it would have been more prudent on her part if she had behaved in a very different manner towards them, and complied with a good grace with their wishes, for, as regarded the baron, anything in the shape of a more extended connection with him was clearly out of the question. But she had gone almost too far for reconciliation, and, although there was no such thing as denying the genius of the lady, she was, for a few moments, puzzled to know what to do. At length, however, she thought it would not be a bad plan to be suddenly quite overcome with her feelings and make a desperate scene. Accordingly, to the surprise of everyone, and the consternation of the admiral, she suddenly uttered a piercing scream and commenced a good exhibition of hysterics. "'Damn it!' cried the admiral. "'What does she mean by that? Come, come, I say, Mother Williams, we cannot stand all that noise. You know, it is quite out of the question.' "'Let us all leave the room,' said Henry, and send Jack Pringle to her. I have heard him say that he has some mode of recovering ladies from hysterics by throwing a pail full of salt water over them and then biting their thumbnails off. The wretch! exclaimed Mrs. Williams, suddenly recovering. The wretch! I'd let him know soon enough what it was to interfere with my nails. Oh, you are better, are you? said the Admiral. What's that to you? shrieked Mrs. Williams. I'll go at once to a lawyer and see what can be done with you. I look upon you all with odium and contempt. "'Ah, words easily spoken,' said the Admiral. "'And just like the young chickens, they commonly go home to roost.' Mrs. Williams darted an angry look at the whole party, which she intended should be expressive at once of the immense contempt in which she held them, and of her determination to have vengeance upon their heads, which double-dealing look, however, had no effect upon them of an intimidating character, and then she bounced from the room. "'My dear,' said the Admiral, turning to Helen, who he saw was affected at the proceeding, "'My dear, don't you fret yourself. Your mother cannot make us angry, and, as far as regards her own anger, it will all subside, and then we will forget that she has said anything at all uncivil to us. So don't you fret yourself about what is of no consequence at all. You may depend, said Henry, that such will be the fact, and that in a very short time you will find that your mother has completely recovered from her anger, and will be as pleasant with us all as possible. I grieve to say so to you, but the fact is, what you must perceive, namely, that as regards your mother, your marriage is merely a matter of pounds, shillings, and pence, and when she finds that the baron's fortune cannot be had, she will content herself with reflecting upon the prospects of Mr. James Anderson, who, if he do well, will soon be quite a favorite. It was humiliating to poor Helen to be forced to confess that this was the correct view to take of the question, but she could not help doing so at all, and after a time she did not regret having sufficient moral courage to resist the command of her mother's to return home. In the society of him whom she loved, and upheld and encouraged, too, as she was by Flora, who was just about the best and kindest companion such a person as Helen could have had, the minutes began to fly past upon rosy pinions, and the remainder of that day, she confessed, even to the Admiral, was the happiest she had known for many a weary month. The Bannerworths and James Anderson fully expected another visit from Mrs. Williams on the morrow, but she did not come and although they had expected her to do so, her not coming was no disappointment, but, on the contrary, a matter for some congratulation. But no time was lost, and as James Anderson was really most anxious to get to London to report himself at the Admiralty, and as that was an anxiety in which the Admiral much encouraged him, so that as it was quite an understood thing among them all that the marriage of the fair Helen should take place before he again left her, a special license was procured, and the ceremony arranged to take place at nine o'clock in the morning, on the second morning after the strange and exciting occurrences at the Anderbury House. This marriage was conducted in the most private manner possible, because, as it had been so well known throughout the whole of Anderbury that Helen Williams was the chosen of the great and rich Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg, who had turned out to be such an equivocal character, the news of her marriage with anyone else would have been sure to have created a vast amount of public curiosity. All this they escaped by fixing the hour at which the ceremony was to be performed at an early hour in the morning, and trusting no one out of their own party with the secret. Of course, from what the reader knows of the gentle and timid disposition of Helen Williams, 
he may well suppose how glad she would have been to have had the countenance of her mother at her marriage, notwithstanding the conduct of that mother was certainly not what should have entitled her to the esteem of any one whatever, not excepting her own child. But this was a feeling which, when she came to consider the new tie she was forming, was likely soon to wear away, and, although, while she pronounced those words which were irrevocably to make her another's, the tears gushed to her eyes, they were far different from those bitter drops she had shed when they considered that, beyond all hope of redemption, she was condemned to become the bride of the baron. When the ceremony was over, they all went back very quietly and comfortably to the inn, and after a good breakfast, and many healths had been drank to the bride, James Anderson, according to arrangement, took his departure for London, leaving Helen in the care of the Bannerworths until he should come back to claim her, as he now could do, despite all the plots and machinations of Mrs. Williams, who, as yet, was in a state of blessed ignorance as to the fact of her daughter's wedding, and who had not quite made up her mind as to what she should do next in so delicate and troublesome a transaction. End of chapter 122 Read by Richard Wallace Liberty, Missouri 1st of May, 2009《Chapter 123 of Barney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Barney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 123. Mrs. Williams takes the initiative and nearly catches an admiral. Mrs. Williams, when she reached home after what must be called her very unsuccessful attempt to make a disturbance, and to do the grand at the inn where the Bannerworths were, set herself seriously to think what would be the best course for her to adopt in the rather perplexing aspect of her affairs. The few words she had used at the inn, indicative of her censure of all the proceedings, had been of rather a strong and energetic character, so that she had a very uncomfortable suspicion upon her mind that she would find it rather a difficult task to pacify her daughter's new friends the offer which the admiral had made to repay to her any expense she had been at impressed her with a belief that he surely must be in possession of what to her was the most delightful thing in the world and comprehended all sorts of virtue namely money and of course her feelings became instantly most wonderfully ameliorated I am very much afraid I have been too precipitate, she said. I really am afraid I have, and that ain't a pleasant reflection by any means. What can I do to get good friends with them all, and particularly the dear old gentleman who promised to pay me? This was the problem which Mrs. Williams presented to her mind, for the captivating idea of actually having been paid five hundred pounds by the baron, and thus sending in a bill of the same amount to the admiral, took wonderful and complete possession of her. This was, indeed, she considered, a master stroke of policy, and all she had now to consider was the means of getting on such good terms with the admiral that he should neither question items nor amount of the account she intended to send him in. If he only pays the five hundred pounds as well as the baron has paid his, I shall not come out of the transaction so badly, said Mrs. Williams. While she was in this state of perplexity, she was sitting by the window of her dining-room, which commanded a view of the street, and, as she sat there, she was much surprised to see Jack Pringle, who she still had a lingering suspicion might, notwithstanding his declaimer of the title, be Admiral Green, on the other side of the way, making various significant movements of his hands and head, as if he had something of an exceedingly secret and strange mysterious nature to communicate to her, Mrs. Williams. This was quite sufficient to call for that lady's most serious attention, and accordingly she walked graciously so close to the window that her aristocratic nose touched the glass, and nodded to Jack, after which she beckoned him across the way, after the manner of the ghost in Hamlet, upon which Jack, with a nod, came across the way forthwith. In another moment Mrs. Williams opened the street door herself, and said, "'Mr. What's-your-name, have you got anything to say to me?' Rather, said Jack. What is it, then? Pray, what is it, Mr. What's-your-name? Don't call me What's-your-name, ma'am, any longer. My name is Jack Pringle. Mr. John Pringle, I suppose? 
no such thing nothing but plain jack ma'am so you see you are mistaken but i have got something to say to you ma'am as you ought to know any one who had known jack would have seen by a certain mischievous twinkling of the eyes that he had on hand what he considered one of the most excellent of jokes in all the world and was about to perpetrate what he thought some famous piece of jollity what it was we shall quickly perceive from his communication with mrs williams well ma'am he added you know admiral bell i believe oh yes yes certainly i do well i don't know as i ought to tell you mrs w what i am going to tell you but first of all the old admiral what with prize money pay and one thing and another is so immensely rich that he really don't know what to do with his money how dreadful said mrs williams i think i could really suggest to him some few things to do oh he is so desperately obstinate he will listen to nobody and you see as he never married who has he got to leave it to at least that's what we have been all wondering for i don't know how long but now what do you think we have found out mrs williams well that's very difficult of course for me to say perhaps you will be so good as to tell me you ought to know he has fallen in love ma'am actually in love for the first time in his life yes he has actually fallen in love mrs williams there's a go and with one of my daughters it's with julia i did mention her to him and i thought i saw a curious expression come across his face of course i'm quite delighted to hear it for with the feelings of a mother i like to get my girls off hand as well as i can and as admiral bell is so very respectable a person i can have no sort of objection in the world there you go again said jack you are quite mistaken i can tell you you never made a greater blunder than that in all your life mother williams excuse me ma'am but that's my way oh don't mention it but where's the mistake my dear sir why just here ma'am just here the admiral is not so young as he was twenty-five years ago and he ain't quite such a fool as to think that a young girl can care anything for him but he is in love for all that only you see ma'am it happens to be with somebody else good gracious who is it and why do you come to me about it because it's you me me oh gracious providence you don't mean that in love with me the rich old admiral he cannot live long how much money take it all together do you really think he has got i declare you have taken me so by surprise that i don't know what i am saying of course he will propose a very handsome settlement you may depend upon all that said jack but the odd thing is you see ma'am that although he is quite over head and ears in love he won't own it but walks about like a bear with a bad place on his back doing nothing but growl growl from morning till night then how can you tell said mrs williams if he never said so oh he does say so he mumbles it out to himself and we have heard him say damn it all that mrs williams is the craft for my money but what's the use of me bothering her about it she wouldn't have an old hulk like me so i won't say anything about it to anybody what an amiable idea very ma'am very and what i have come to you for now is to say that if you have no objection to the match you might as well make the old man happy by letting him know in some sort of way that you wouldn't be so hard-hearted as he thinks but would have him if he would say the word how can i express how obliged i am to you mr wingle pringle if you please ma'am is my name and as to being obliged to me you ain't at all and i'll tell you how you see i and the admiral have sailed with each other for many a voyage and i have a sort of feeling for the old man that makes me when i see that he has a fancy try my best to gratify him and without thinking of anybody but him i've come to you just to tell you what i know about the affair and i must leave it to you to do what you like still i am very much obliged to you what if i were to call and ask for a private interview with the old man a good idea said jack it was only the other day i heard him say you was his pearl and the main chain of his heart i can tell you and ever such a load more he will be taking his dinner at four to-day and after that he usually takes a sleep in an armchair in a room by himself and if you like to come then you will catch him be assured my dear sir i shall be there punctually to the minute you will be so good as to receive me and introduce me to him and perhaps it would remove some of his timidity if i were to let him know that i was aware that he called me his pearl and the main chain of his heart 
of course it would said jack you put him in mind of it ma'am and if you find him backward a little don't you mind about giving him a little encouragement because you know all the while he really means it so you need not care about it well mr ah uh, ah uh, bingle all i can say is that i feel very much obliged to you indeed for letting me know this matter and my great respect for you and for the old admiral will i assure you induce me to consent to what you propose ahem of course i have many offers as you may well suppose mr kringle damn it said jack i've told you before that my name is pringle and if you can't recollect that just call me jack and have done with it you won't forget jack i'll be bound call me that and i shan't quarrel with you about it ma'am but don't be inventing all sorts of odd names for me pray excuse me my dear sir i certainly will do no such thing and at three o'clock i hope i shall have the pleasure of seeing you i believe it's the red lion where you are staying yes the red lion inn and at three i shall be on the lookout for you ma'am you may depend and i only hope you won't mistake the admiral's bashfulness for anything else because i assure you he is mad in love with you but won't like to own it ma'am so just you bring him out a little and don't you mind what he says mrs williams duly promised she would not mind what the old man said and from what we know of that lady we are quite inclined for once in a way to give her credit for sincerity in that matter and the greatest possible amount of candor as for jack when he left her house and had got fairly round the corner and out of sight he laughed to that excess that several passers-by stopped to look at him in wonder and had he not ceased he certainly would have had a crowd around him in a very few minutes longer that would have perhaps thought him out of his senses but after a few minutes the explosion of his bottled-up mirth had subsided and after giving a boy who was nearest to him of the admiring spectators a good rap on the head he walked to the inn jack would have been glad to have told some one of the capital joke he was playing off at the admiral's expense but he was afraid of being betrayed so he wisely kept the secret of the forthcoming jest all to himself although henry bannerworth and charles holland might both after such a thing happened or even during its progress have a good laugh at it it is not to be supposed entertaining as they did so great a respect for the old admiral that they would have lent themselves to the perpetration of such a joke as may be supposed mrs williams was all flutter and expectation and the idea of at length mending her decayed fortune by an union with the old man who was reported to be immensely rich and who had already reached an age when his life could not be depended upon one week from another was one of the most gratifying circumstances on record to her no possible plan could have been devised which was so likely to chime in with her humour as this and if she had been asked in which way she would like to make money it would have been that which she would have undoubtedly chosen now she thought i shall after all make an admirable thing of this affair there can be no doubt i shall of course soon be a widow again for the old sea monster cannot live long i shall insist upon a very liberal settlement indeed and then i suppose while he does live i must keep him in good humour so that he may leave me at all events the bulk of his property when he dies and then i can live in the style i like and make everybody die of envy to excite an extraordinary amount of envy was the very height of felicity to mrs williams as indeed it is to many people of far greater pretensions than that lady and we cannot help thinking when we see gaudy equipages and all the glittering and costly paraphernalia of parvenu wealth that the great object of it is to excite envy far more than admiration and pleasure there are the narrowages and the staples and the jenkinses thought mrs williams oh i know they will all be ready to eat their very heads off when they hear that i am married and that too so well oh they will die of spite and particularly mrs jenkins i am quite sure she will have a serious illness these were the kind of triumphs upon which mrs williams felicitated herself and pictured to her imagination as the result of her marriage with the admiral which she now looked upon as quite a settled thing because if he were willing she felt perfectly sure that she was and therefore what was to prevent the union from taking place what pleasant anticipations these were really we can almost consider them while they lasted as sufficient to counterbalance any disappointment which was likely afterwards to take place and the hour or two which mrs williams devoted to the gorgeous dream of wealth she so fully expected to enjoy 
were probably the most delightful she had ever passed. And certainly, so far she had to thank Jack Pringle for giving her so much satisfaction, although, as will be seen, she did not feel towards him any great amount of gratitude on the momentous occasion. Mrs. Williams, no doubt, still thought herself quite a fascinating woman, and when she had failed in guessing that it was to herself that the admiral was, according to Jack's account, devoted, it was not that she entertained a modest and quiet opinion of her own attractions, but from the force of habit, seeing that so long a period had elapsed without her having an admirer, that she could not believe she had one then until actually assured in plain language of the fact. And now, about half an hour before the appointed time, the lady arrayed herself in what she considered an extremely becoming and fashionable costume, and started to keep her appointment with Jack Pringle, who, in her affections, now held quite a pleasant place, and towards whom she considered herself so much indebted for the kind information she had received at his hands. The distance from any house in Anderbury to any other was but short, so that Mrs. Williams was within the time mentioned when she reached the door of the Red Lion, but she was gratified to find that Jack Pringle was there, apparently on the lookout for her, because it showed that nothing had happened to alter the aspect of affairs, but that the chances of her becoming Mrs. Admiral Bell were as strong as ever. "'I'm glad you have come,' said Jack. "'They got over dinner rather quick, and that's a fact, and the old man is fast asleep as usual, so you can commence operations at once.' "'A thousand thanks, a thousand thanks, my good friend, and you may depend upon my gratitude.' "'Hush, never mind that,' said Jack. "'I don't want nothing. This way, this way, ma'am, if you please.' End of chapter 123。二十六、二十七、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、三十八、by Thomas Prescott Prest. Note, chapters 124 and 125 do not exist in the text. Chapter 126. The Admiral in a Breeze, a General Commotion, and Jack Pringle Much Wanted but Not to be Found. To say that Mrs. Williams was on the tiptoe of expectation is to say very little that can convey a good idea of what was her real condition, nervously speaking, as she followed Jack Pringle up, not the principal, but a back staircase of the inn, toward the room where the admiral took his nap, which was, his custom always of an afternoon. The fact is that Jack had a great dread of Mrs. Williams being seen by any of the Bannerworth family, because they all knew her, and the nice little plot that he had got up for the purpose of holding out the admiral to ridicule, while at the same time he enjoyed the immense satisfaction of having some revenge upon Mrs. Williams. Hence was it that, like many a great politician, he went up the back staircase instead of the front, in order to avoid the unnecessary observation and remark. By good fortune, as well as good management, Jack met nobody, but succeeded in reaching the room door, within which the admiral was sleeping, in perfect safety. "'Now, ma'am,' said Jack, "'don't you be backward about going forward, cos, as I tell you, the old man is dying by inches for you.' and I don't see why you shouldn't have his half a million of money as well as anybody else. Ah, and a good deal better, too, when one comes to consider all things. Thank you, Mr. Pringle, thank you. I really don't know how to express my obligations to you upon my word. You are so very kind and considerate in all you say. Oh, don't mention it, ma'am. Walk in, and there you will find the old baby. I shouldn't wonder but he's disturbing his old brains by dreaming of you now. Jack opened the door, and Mrs. Williams glided noiselessly into the apartment, where, seated, sure enough, in an easy chair, with a silk handkerchief over his face, sat the admiral, fast asleep, enjoying that comfortable siesta, which he never for one moment imagined would be disturbed in the manner it was about to be. "'Well,' said Mrs. Williams, "'there he is, to be sure, just as Jack Pringle said, asleep, and no doubt dreaming of me.' I must make sure of the old fool in one interview, or he may slip through my fingers, and that would not be at all pleasant after counting upon him and taking some trouble on the matter. 
but although she made up her mind that nothing should be wanting upon her part to make sure of him yet she debated whether she ought to awaken him or not for she well knew that many old people especially men were very irascible if they are awakened suddenly and from what she had already seen of the admiral she could very well imagine that such might be the case with him this was getting rather a quandary, out of which Mrs. Williams did not exactly see her way, and yet the proposition that the admiral was to be, and must be, awakened in some way, remained as firmly as ever fixed in her mind. And then, too, the idea, a very natural one under the circumstances, came across her that each minute was fraught with danger, and that, for all she knew, the yea or nay of the whole affair might depend upon the promptitude with which it was concluded. What if, she asked herself, some of the odious Bannerworth people were to come in and find her there. Of course they would awaken the admiral at once, and in consequence of their presence she would lose all opportunity of exercising those little blandishments which she meant to bring to bear upon him. This was positively alarming. The idea of all being lost prompted her at all events to attempt something, so Mrs. Williams thought that the mildest way of awaking the admiral was by a loud sneeze, which she executed without producing the least effect, as might have been expected, for the man who had many a time slept soundly in the wildest fury of the elements was not likely to awaken because somebody sneezed. Dear me, how sound he sleeps! Ahem! Ahem! Achoo! Ahem! Achooey! The admiral was proof against all this, and Mrs. Williams might just as well have spared herself the trouble of exciting such an amount of artificial sneezes, for the admiral slept on, and it was quite clear that something much more sonorous would be required for the purpose of awakening him. How vexatious, she thought, how very vexatious, but there's no help for it. Awakened he must be, that's quite clear, and if fair means won't do it, why, foul must. Acting upon this resolve, Mrs. Williams hesitated no longer, but, approaching the sleeping admiral, she dragged the handkerchief off his face, and its passage over his nose, no doubt, produced the tickling sensation that induced him to give that organ a very hard rub, indeed, and start wide awake with an exclamation that was much more forcible than elegant, and that consequently we need not transfer to our pages at all. "'Oh, Admiral,' said Mrs. Williams, assuming a look that ought at once to have melted a heart of stone, "'Oh, Admiral, can you indeed forgive me?' "'The devil,' said the Admiral, can you, indeed, look over the fact that in my anxiety to see that face I took from before it the envious and yet fortunate handkerchief that covered it? It was my act, and upon my head fall all the censure, my dear good kind admiral. The old man rubbed his eyes very hard with his knuckles, as he said, I suppose I'm awake. You are awake, my dear sir. It is indeed no dream, let me assure you, that disturbs you, but a living reality. You are awake, my dear sir. Why, why, what do you mean? I begin to think I am awake with a vengeance. But who are you? Hang me if I don't think you are old Mother Williams. Oh, my dear Admiral, you are so facetious, so very facetious. But can you for one moment fancy, my dear sir, that I am insensible to your merit? Can you fancy that I could look with other than indulgent eyes upon a bell? Upon a what? A bell, an Admiral bell. Indeed, I may say, with a slight but pardonable alteration of a word, an admirable bell. My dear sir, your pearl speaks to you. The admiral was so amazed at this address, accompanied as it was by most languishing looks, that, with his mouth wide open, and his eyes preternaturally distended, he gazed upon Mrs. Williams without saying a word, from which she inferred that he was beginning to see that she was aware of his attachment to her, and was thinking of how he could best express his gratitude for her taking the initiative in the matter. Thus encouraged, then, she spoke again, saying, as she advanced close to him, Oh, my dear sir, what a thing the human heart is! Only to think now, that from the first moment I saw you, I should whisper to myself, There, yes, there is the only human being for whose sake I could again enter into that holy state from which the death of Mr. Williams released me. "'Why, good God!' said the Admiral. "'The woman's mad!' "'Oh, no, no, the world, the horrid low workaday world, may make invidious remarks about us, but your pearl will recompense you for all that, and in the sweet concord of domestic life we shall never sigh for more than we shall have, 
which will be, of course, if I understand rightly, a large income. I don't know how much a year, and if I ask, it is only out of curiosity, my dear sir, and nothing else. Love, absolute and beautiful love, is all I ask. Helloa, roared the admiral. Charles, Henry, Jack, where the devil are you all? Damn it, you are all ready enough when I don't want you, but now, when I am going to be boarded by a mad woman, you can't come one of you. Hello, help, Charles, Jack, you lubber, where the deuce have you taken yourself to, and why don't you tumble up when you are sent for? But, my dear sir, why need you trouble yourself to call so many witnesses to our happiness? Let us be privately married in some rural church. Privately damned first I'd be, said the old admiral. Oh, then, it shall be a public alliance if you wish it, exclaimed Mrs. Williams, as she made up her mind to clinch the affair at once by a coup de main, and advancing to the admiral, she flung her arms around his neck, just as a door at the other end of the apartment opened, and Charles and Henry, with Flora, made their appearance, and looked with the most intense astonishment at the scene before them. "'Well, uncle,' said Charles, "'I certainly should not have expected this of you. I am astonished, I must confess.' nor i said henry why admiral i had no idea you were so dangerous a personage mrs williams when she saw what arrivals had taken place gave a faint scream and released the admiral and then she added oh admiral how could you hold me so when you hear somebody coming how shall i ever survive such a scene as this my character will be gone for ever unless i am immediately married to you and i have no doubt but that all your friends will at once see the propriety of such a step I do, said Charles. And I, said Henry. And I, of course, said Flora. Mrs. Williams burst into tears when she saw this unanimity of opinion, but the admiral's face got the color of a piece of beetroot, and he was only silent for a moment or two, while he was made the subject of these cruel remarks, until he could sufficiently recover to speak with the energy that did characterize him when he really began. We are not exactly in the vein to transfer to our pages the violent expletives with which he garnished his outburst of passion, and our readers, if they recall to their minds a large amount of nautical oaths, can have no difficulty in supposing that the admiral uttered every one of them with a volubility that was perfectly alarming. Damn it! Do you mean to kill me, all of you, or to drive me mad? Five oaths in a string came in here. Do you want to cut me up, you— Three horrible epithets. What do you mean by setting this old woman upon me? Whose precious idea was this, I should like to know, to put an elderly she-dragon upon me, whom I hate and be, ten oaths at least, when I was enjoying a comfortable nap? Hate? exclaimed Mrs. Williams. Did you say hate, you old seducing villain, when you knew you said I was your pearl, you hoary-headed ruffian? That's a thundering crammer, cried the admiral. You said it yourself and as for hating you, damn it, if I don't do that with all my heart. And this is the way I am to be treated before people? Oh, you wicked old sinner, I understand you now. Your intentions were not honorable, and now you find that my virtue is proof against your horrid old fascinations, you want to pretend that it is all a mistake. Really, said Charles, we must confess, uncle, that we found Mrs. Williams and you, ahem, <clears throat> rather loving, you know, and the gentleman on these occasions is usually asked to account for such things, I take it. Of course, said Mrs. Williams, I'll bring an action against the admiral, and I shall call upon you all to be witnesses for me. Oh, you old sinner, I'll make you pay for this. We certainly can all be witnesses, said Flora, that the admiral called for help, and when we came in we found Mrs. Williams holding him fast round the neck, to which he seemed to have the greatest possible repugnance. "'That's right. Hurrah! That's the truth, Flora, my dear. That's just how it was. This horrid old woman came all of a sudden and laid hold of me after awakening me, and then I called for help. That's how it was.' "'But these gentlemen,' said Mrs. Williams, appealing to Henry and Charles, "'will swear quite different.' "'Oh, I beg your pardon, Mrs. Williams,' said Charles. "'If we are brought forward to swear anything, we must be correct, and therefore we shall have to say just what this lady has stated.' and perhaps your best plan will be to go away and say no more about it, but consider that you have made a mistake. A mistake! screamed Mrs. Williams. How could I make a mistake when Mr. John Pringle, who knows the Admiral so well, 
told me that he was dying to see me and in love with me to never such an extent only that he was afraid i would not have anything to say to him on such a subject the admiral drew a long breath and sat down then clenching his hand he shook it above his head saying in a voice of deep and concentrated anger i thought as much damn it if i did not it's all that infernal scoundrel jack pringle's doings i find it's one of that lubberly mutinous thief's tricks and it's the last one he shall ever play me a trick screamed mrs williams a trick you don't mean that ah me what compensation shall i get for the dreadful circumstance which has made me confess the secret of my heart what shall i do oh what shall i do when shall i hope for consolation what sum of money even if you my dear admiral were to offer it to me would be a sufficient balm now to my wounded heart madam said henry it seems as if you have been imposed upon and made the victim of a practical joke which we nor the admiral can have nothing to do with and the only consolation we can offer to your wounded heart is that we will keep the secret of your attachment most inviolate what compensation is that to me i'll bring my action for breach of promise of marriage if i don't get something and that's something very handsome too it's all very fine to talk to me about your mistakes i'll be paid ah and paid well too or i'll make the whole country ring again with the matter madam said charles i dare say the admiral don't care one straw whether the country rings again or not and you can do just as you please but since you have commenced threatening you will i hope see the obvious propriety of at once leaving his place i will leave this place but it shall be to go direct to my solicitor and see what he shall say to a lone woman being treated in this way i'll swear that he called me his pearl and if that don't get me a verdict and most exemplary damages i don't know what will we shall see what we shall see and in the meantime you wretches i'll leave you all to contempt yes contempt stop a bit ma'am said the admiral it's quite plain to me that you don't mind how you earn a trifle so that you do get it and now i'll tell you that if you find out that rascal jack pringle and give him a good trouncing for his share in the business you may come to me for a reward mrs williams whatever might have been her personal feelings on this head did not deign to make the least reply to this intimation but suddenly cried i want to see my daughter she's not here at present said flora and if she were she is mrs anderson now and therefore would of course decline accompanying you to your home and she is only waiting some arrangements of her husband's prior most probably to going to london with him this speech brought to the recollection of mrs williams that the admiral had promised her all the expenses that she had been at contingent upon the broken-off marriage of her daughter with the baron and she began to consider that her action for breach of promise of marriage against him might fail and that if it succeeded it might not bring in half so much as the amount of the bill she could by fair means get out of him these considerations were of great pith and amount and they had their full effect upon mrs williams so instead of bursting out with any further reproaches she sat down and commenced a softening process by a copious flood of tears which she had always at command oh said the old admiral you may well cry over it old girl i suppose you really thought you had hooked the old man at last eh but never do you mind you may make a good thing of it yet if you get a hold of that scoundrel pringle and serve him out well i'll pay for that job more willingly than for anything else i know of just at present don't speak to me of that brute my dear sir sobbed mrs williams it's a very cruel thing of course to be used in this way and as it's all a mistake on my part i hope you will excuse and look after what has happened i am sure i should be the last person in the world to trouble anybody with visits who did not want to see me and so i dare say we shall only meet once again in this world once again madam what is the use of our ever meeting again it would look decidedly disrespectful on my part if i were not to hand you the bill myself for the little matters that you were kind enough to say you would pay for on account of what i had expended on helen's projected marriage with that vampire baron you know admiral oh ah i recollect now well well i don't want to go back from my word and as i did promise you why i will pay you but as i don't want on any account the pleasure of your company again 
you will be so kind, ma'am, as to take this twenty pounds note and keep the change. This the admiral thought liberal enough, for his idea of matrimonial preparations consisted of a new dress or two, or so, and which twenty pounds ought fairly enough to cover, and he thought he would do well enough by overpaying Mrs. Williams, as he believed, with that amount. When Mrs. Williams recovered from her surprise, not unmingled with indignation, into which this most audacious, and, to her, extraordinary offer threw her, she spoke with a kind of scream that made the old admiral jump again as she shouted in his ears, "'What? Twenty pounds? Are you in your senses? Twenty pounds! Why, my bill will be at least five hundred pounds!' "'What?' roared the admiral. "'Are you in your senses? Damn it, ma'am, you may swallow your bill, and you had better do so for all the good that it is likely to do you. For if I pay a farthing more, may I be hung up on my old yard-arm. Why, you must think that a British admiral is another name for a fool.' "'Then I'll tell you what,' said Mrs. Williams. "'I'll tell you what, you stupid, old, atrocious sinner. I tell you I will bring my action against you for breach of promise of marriage, and I'll swear that, before your gang of people here came in, who, of course, will swear black is white and white is crimson for you, because I believe you are the father of them all, that you first asked me to live with you, and when I refused, you said you would marry me by special license to-morrow.' "'Madam,' said Charles, now that you think proper entirely to forget that you are a lady, allow me to beg of you to retire, because it is quite impossible, after all that has happened, that I should hold any further conversation with you. Yes, Mrs. Williams, said Henry, I hope you will perceive the propriety of at once leaving. At this moment a note was handed to Henry, who, upon opening it, read aloud, The Baron Stolmoyer of Salzburg presents his compliments to Mr. Bannerworth, and begs to state that Mrs. Williams has received from him the sum of five hundred pounds for expenses to be incurred on account of the wedding of her daughter, and he hereby fully empowers Mr. Bannerworth to demand of Mrs. Williams that sum, and to devote it to the service and uses of Mr. James Anderson, of whose existence the Baron was not aware when he made his proposal to Mrs. Williams for her daughter, whom she sold to him, the Baron, for that sum. Hilloa! cried the Admiral. "'What do you think of that, Mrs. Williams? "'I don't know what you will say to it, "'but I know very well that I should consider it "'a shot between wind and water.' "'I trust,' said Henry, "'that you will now still further see the propriety of leaving here, "'and of letting this matter completely rest, "'because it strikes me that the more you investigate it, madam, "'the more it will turn out greatly to your disadvantage.' "'I don't care a pin's head for any of you, "'nor half a farthing,' cried Mrs. Williams.' The baron gave me the money, and he has no power to get it back again, as you know well enough. I'll bring my action, and my principal witness shall be Mr. Pringle, who came to my house, and who, if put upon his oath, will be obliged to swear that it was all a lark, said Jack, popping his head just within the amazingly short distance that he opened the door, and then he disappeared before a word could be said to him. Mrs. Williams, who, notwithstanding all her threats, seemed to have a lingering impression that she was victimized in the transaction, had all the ire of her nature aroused at once by the sight of Jack, and she at once rushed after him, leaving the admiral and the bannerworths not at all lamenting her loss. Jack had no idea that he would be followed by anybody but the admiral, and to distance him he knew there was no occasion to run, so when he had got down to the hall of the hotel he subsided into a walk until he heard a tremendous scuffling of feet behind him, and upon looking round, saw Mrs. Williams in full chase, and with an expression upon her countenance which plainly enough indicated that her intentions were not at all of a jocular character. "'The devil,' said Jack, "'if here ain't Mother Williams coming full sail, and at fourteen knots an hour, too, with a fair wind I'll be bound. Never mind, a stern chase is a long chase, so here goes.' As Jack uttered these remarks, he dashed onwards at tremendous speed, but the sight of him again had inflamed Mrs. William's wrath to madness, and she made the most incredible exertion to come up with him, so that it was really wonderful to see her. But Jack, being less encumbered by apparel than the lady, would have distanced her but for an unlucky accident that gave her a temporary mastery. The fates would have it that a baker with a tray upon his head, containing sundry pies, was coming up the street, 
and as people do sometimes when they are mutually anxious to pass each other without coming in contact, they dodged from side to side for a few seconds, and then, of course, ran against each other, as if they really meant it, with such force, that down came Jack and Baker and Pies in one grand smash. In another moment the enraged Mrs. Williams reached the spot. To snatch up the only whole pie there was left was to the lady the work of a moment, and to reverse it upon Jack's face was the work of another moment, and then, in the vindictiveness of her rage, she stamped upon the bottom of the dish until his head was embedded in damsons, and he was nearly smothered. From the window of the inn the Bannerworths and the Admiral saw all this take place, and the delight of the old man was of the most extravagant character, exceeding all bounds, while the Bannerworths, for the life of them, could not help laughing most heartily. "'Now, you wretch,' said Mrs. Williams, "'I hope this will be a lesson to you. Take that, and that!' and that you sea snake you odious tar barrel as she spoke she hammered on the dish till it broke and that was for jack the best thing that could have happened for it gave him a little air and by a frantic effort he scrambled to a sitting posture and commenced dragging the damsons out of his eyes and mouth mrs williams then thought it was high time to leave and so muttering threats to the immense amusement of a crowd of persons who had assembled she walked away leaving Jack by no means delighted with the end of the adventure, and to settle with the infuriated baker as best he might. There was no small additional mortification to Jack to look up and see the Admiral and the Bannerworths at the window of the hotel, enjoying his discomfiture, and laughing most heartily at his expense. End of chapter 126「Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 127. A Change of Scene and Circumstances, An Event in London. The recent events which followed each other so rapidly were strangely concluded by the sudden and mysterious disappearance of Sir Francis Varney. That he should thus have eluded all was aggravating to a very large class of people, who seemed to insist that he should have come to some notable catastrophe. Had he only been killed, they argued, we should have known the last of him. Of the truth of this there could be no doubt. When a man is dead and buried, you do, as far as human nature serves, know the end of him. But this great fact does not always come within the knowledge of men, who sometimes, contrary to expectation, drop off themselves, and instead of knowing the end of somebody else, why, somebody else knows the end of them. It is a well-known fact, that as some die before others, that it does sometimes happen that those who wish to see another out may be seen out themselves. Besides, taking the question of longevity aside, it does not follow, because we so wish to come to the conclusion of an affair, that its author may but change the scene and transport it elsewhere, and the good and curious lieges become defrauded of their self-satisfying knowledge, viz. the end of the affair. Of course it was an aggravation to know that there was an interesting and highly exciting affair gone off, and they were not allowed to peep into that mystery, the future but so it was, they were not gratified. Some were of the opinion that he had departed this life in a mysterious and unsatisfactory, because secret manner, and that was why nobody could tell anything about it. But there were other opinions afloat, and among others that of the admiral, which was pretty general, which was that he had very likely disappeared from that part of the world to seek in some other place the renovation his system required, by means that were natural to him, but hideous in others to contemplate or think of. This was generally the received opinion, for it was universally admitted by the wise people thereabouts that he must at certain times recruit himself. The opinion thus entertained by all who lived thereabouts became less and less absorbing. Other matters began to be thought of, things began to flow into their usual channel, and a subsidence took place in the turmoil and excitement consequent upon the presence of the vampire. About this period, while these parts were regaining their original serenity and calmness, and while the vampire was looked upon as an awful and fearful episode in the life of those who lived there, 
there happened in london a circumstance that it is necessary to relate to the reader inasmuch as it is very important and bears strongly on our story not far from bloomsbury square which at the period of our story was a very fashionable place and in one of the first streets thereabout was the house of a widow whose name was meredith she had been the wife of a man in good circumstances but at his death she was left with a house filled with furniture some little loose cash and several daughters marriageable and unmarriageable this being all mr meredith had to leave there could be but one way of obtaining a living at least but one that suggested itself to her which was to turn lodging-house keeper of the better sort her children had been well educated that is sufficiently so to pass off in life in decent society without any particular remark as she was well calculated for the object she had in view it was no wonder that she succeeded in her undertaking and appeared to do very well about this time an arrival occurred at an hotel not very far from this spot which caused a communication to pass to mrs meredith who had been recommended lodgers from the hotel when any of the inmates desired to be accommodated and wished for a place with all the comforts of a home and domestic attention mrs meredith said the head waiter of the hotel i wish to have a word in private with you with greatest pleasure mr jones said mrs meredith who was extremely civil to the waiter will you be pleased to sit down i have not the time i thank you i have not time but i have run over to you to inform you we have an old invalid colonel at our place who seems as if he did not know what he wanted he wants some kind of lodging he don't like the hotel whether there is some genteel family whose kind attentions would soothe his disorders and i suppose his temper oh poor gentleman said mrs meredith how unfortunate he should suffer is he rich yes i believe so very rich he's a colonel in the india service he's been a fine man but he has had some hard knocks i have seen more rickety matters than he before to-day and he will do very well i told him i knew where there was a lady who occasionally admitted an inmate to her house which was a large one but she must be satisfied that her lodger is a gentleman has she any family he inquired because i hate to go where there's nobody but the lady of the house because she can't always attend upon me read to me and the like of that goodness me what an odd man yes but he pays well a retired colonel large fortune you know that these east indians expect i don't know what they are even fed by beautiful young black virgins the wretch oh dear no it's the custom of the country so you see he's been humoured and it will be necessary yet to humour him if you mean to have him for your lodger i expect he'll only be troublesome but when they pay for trouble why it's all profit very true replied mrs meredith is he a single man yes oh yes i believe he has never been married has had so much to do in india that he had nothing to do with marriages where does he come from india i believe he had a very fine palace of his own at putty therapore so i am told lord he seems to think nothing of these parts but he's an odd man however he pays well he'll make a good lodger anywhere well you may tell him mr jones that we have a fine suite of rooms for his accommodation on the first floor and bedrooms every attention he can wish you know our terms mr jones i think but i may as well tell you five guineas a week five guineas a week eh yes that is moderate when you come to consider what a trouble and an expense it will be to get such things as will please the palate of an indian it is a trouble certainly and besides that he will have such a place and furniture as he seldom meets with in london besides from what you say there will be little trouble in attending to him by myself and daughters and you know i have several exactly exactly that is the thing he seems to desire you will therefore have a preference over any one else who may have anything he wants a kind of domestic hearth he has none of his own you see has he no friends none living i dare say besides he would hardly like to trust himself along with relations who would poison him for the sake of his money and if he have any living he may know nothing of them where they are or anything else and they would be as strangers to him for he would not be able to recognize them but i must go now five guineas that includes all yes all except wines and liquors you know very well i'll let him know and perhaps you'll be in the way in case he should come around this evening to examine the place 
Do you think there is any chance of his coming in to night? Really, I cannot tell. He may or may not, just as he pleases. He is an odd fish. But, good Mrs. Meredith, I will talk to him. The waiter left, and Mrs. Meredith sat in her parlor, which was her own private apartment, which she and her daughters usually retired to and received their own friends. Here they remained, in some degree kept in continual expectation. Nothing was said for some time by either mother or daughter, for there was but one at home at that time. "'Do you know, Margaret,' she said, "'we are likely to have a new lodger?' "'Indeed, ma?' "'Yes, my dear. He is a fidgety old man, a colonel from India. He is vastly rich, I am given to understand, and will require all the attentions of a relative. He will pay very handsomely. In fact, my dear, he will keep us all with a little care and management.' "'Well, Ma, the men ought to do so, the creatures. What are they for if they don't? I am sure if ever I come to marry, which I am sure I shan't, and if I found that he didn't find me in all I wanted, wouldn't I lead him a life? I rather think I would,' said the amiable child. "'I'd never let him know peace night nor day. It would be useless for him to tell me misfortune had deprived him of means. That would do for me. Oh, dear, no, a married man has no right to meet misfortunes. Indeed, he deserves to be punished for having a wife at all under such circumstances. A very proper spirit, my dear, but you must never let such a thing as that pass your lips, because it would be very likely to cause you to lose a chance. The men are so fastidious nowadays, and they think they win us when we angle for and catch them. And this lodger, ma? Oh, he's, as I told you, a rich old East Indian. At this moment a coach drove up to the door, and a tremendous double rap was played off upon the door, as if it had been committed by a steam-engine, so loud and so long was the application for the admittance, that both mother and daughter started. "'Dear me, that must be him,' said the mother. "'Yes, a coach and all. There, there, I declare.' "'What, ma?' "'Why, look at that girl next door out in the balcony. There's Miss Smith. That girl is always trying to attract some person or other, and the men affect to believe that she is beautiful.' For my part, I think a girl of seventeen ought to have more modesty. The hussy, said the young lady, contemptuously. The servant now entered to inform her that a gentleman had called about the apartments. Ask him upstairs, said Mrs. Meredith, and she prepared to follow the colonel so soon as she heard he was ascending the stairs, which was a slow job to him as he walked lame with a gold-headed cane. When Mrs. Meredith came to the room, she saw a tall gentleman, his height was lost on account of him stooping. He wore a green shade over one eye, and had one arm in a sling, besides which, as we have before related, he was rather lame. "'Not so bad as I thought for,' muttered Mrs. Meredith to herself, as she curtsied to his salute. "'I have been recommended to seek here a lodging, ma'am. I do not know if I am correct in believing you have such as I want. This, sir, is the sitting-room. It is a very handsome one, and above what is visually offered in a lodging-house. The fact is, sir, the house was never furnished for letting, but for our own private occupation. Therefore it has all of the comforts of a private residence. That is what I chiefly want. You see, I do not care to undertake the trouble of setting up an establishment myself. I am alone, I may say. Therefore it is I seek such a lodging as comes nearest to what I should myself choose if I were to make a home of my own. Precisely, sir, there is the back drawing-room, and a bedroom upstairs. Oh, very good. I need, I presume, make no inquiry as to what kind of table you keep. The best, I dare say. I was informed of the price you asked. Yes, we consider that quite moderate, sir. I dare say, said the Indian, looking about the place with an air of curiosity. I dare say. Yes, sir, you see the advantages we offer are much above the usual run. Besides, you are an invalid, and will require extra attention." Yes, there is much truth in that. I have used to it, and therefore you will see that I bargain for it. But at the same time, you will not find me difficult to please, I flatter myself. But we shall know more of each other the longer we are together. Certainly, sir, I can assure you that should you take the apartments, nothing on my part or my daughter's will be wanting to make your stay agreeable. The stranger examined the appearance of the room and the others, and then, after much conversation with them, he agreed to take the lodgings, and to come into them on the morrow, as he was extremely particular as to well-aired beds, and should require them all to be re-aired. And now, madame, before I finally agree to come in, 
will you show me the means of escape, if any, in case of fire? I am anxious about that. I have read so many calamities arising from that cause of late in London, that I am somewhat nervous about it, though I am so much of an invalid that I should hardly be able to avail myself of it. You shall see, sir, said Mrs. Meredith, we have ample and safe accommodation in that respect. You see, here is a pair of broad steps that lead up to that door, a trap-door, and here is another that opens upon the leads at the top of the house. The colonel made shift to walk up, and to look over the house-tops. There was a sea of chimneys and pantiles, at the same time they were all easy of access on this side of the street. So there was no danger from fire, and each house there was similarly provided. Well, madame, I think I may say that this affair is concluded. I will leave you my card, and, if you think proper, you can obtain what information you desire of me at the hotel. I am quite satisfied, sir, said the landlady, as she took the card that was proffered her, and also a bank-note which he offered her, in token for his taking possession of the lodgings. Mrs. Meredith curtsied, and the colonel left the apartment, and descended the staircase with great deliberation, for he could not go very swiftly. He was lame, and one arm was up in a sling, and therefore he had not the free use of his limbs. As he came down the stairs, and when near the mat, Margaret, the eldest daughter, came out and passed into the back parlour, for no other ostensible purpose than that of seeing the stranger, whose eye was instantly, but only momentarily, fixed upon her. But it was enough. They both saw each other, and had a glance at the features, and Margaret disappeared. The stranger stepped into the coach, and, as the door was being shut, he looked up to the windows of the next house, where the young lady, nothing daunted, still sat at the window, and so little was she interested with her neighbor's affairs, that she barely bestowed a momentary glance upon the coach or its occupant, whose solitary optic took notice of her, and then the Jehu drove away with his rumbling vehicle. "'Well, I never saw such impudence in my life,' said Mrs. Meredith, as she came to the parlor windows, which happened to bow outwards and give her a better opportunity of watching her neighbors to the right and left of her. "'What is the matter, Ma?' inquired her daughter. "'Why, there's that minx, still up yonder. I declare if she didn't stare at the colonel. He saw her and noticed her, too. Well, I wouldn't have had her there to-day for a trifle. He will think he's got into a bad neighborhood, seeing her so bold. Really, now, she lays herself open to all kinds of imputations. I do not mean to say any evil of her, but really, if she will do that now, what will she not do by and by? I am sorry she has no one to advise her better. I am sure she is old enough to know better, rejoined the daughter. I am quite sure she is no beauty, and if she wants to catch any of the men, she won't be successful in that manner, unless indeed she doesn't care whom she picks up with. Oh, that is, I fear, too often the case with young girls with weak intellects. But did you see our new lodger, my dear? Yes, ma'am. And what did you think of him? inquired Mrs. Meredith, with an amiable whine and a gentle rubbing of hands. Think, ma, think. What can I think of a man whom I have hardly seen, ma? He only passed me. I could not recollect him again if I tried. Ah, well, my dear, you know best. I can always recollect people whom I have once seen. He is a very fine man. At least he has been. He has lost much of his height, for he is lame and stoops much. But still he has been a handsome man. One eye only, ma, I think. Yes, dear, one eye, as you say. But I think a remarkably keen one, too. He's quite the gentleman, too. He's been used to command, you can see that. These military men have an air about them that you cannot mistake. And even this gentleman, though you see, wounded and lame, yet he has the air of an officer about him. He may have, ma, but you know, if he gave the air of a general with nothing else, he would buy a very poor dinner. So it would, my dear. You certainly are an extraordinary girl, Margaret, a very extraordinary girl, and will be the making of your family. Only suppose you should marry this rich colonel. What then, eh? I only say, suppose you were to marry him, because it isn't certain yet. Well, wouldn't that minx next door think you were lucky? She would bite her nails in anger. Yes, she would, ma, but it may never happen. But if she thinks to get a bow that way, she's much mistaken. I am sure she will get insulted. No wonder. But, Margaret, my dear, you must do your best to please this gentleman. He wants to have people about him just as if he had his own home. He has no friends or relatives. Who knows what may happen yet? No, ma, we don't know what may happen, and I will do my best to please him. But I shan't court him, you know, ma. He must do that. 
yes certainly my child he must no you mustn't appear anxious about it but merely say you are pleased to have his good opinion and you must be a little coy of everything else for there are times when such old gentlemen are easily entrapped but i must set about having things aired and put into order for his arrival to-morrow end of chapter one hundred twenty seven Chapter One Hundred and Twenty Eight of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter One Hundred and Twenty Eight The New Lodger, A Night Alarm, A Mysterious Circumstance. It was not until late the next day that Mrs. Meredith heard anything of her new lodger. All she had heard was that he would be there during the day, but whether to breakfast, dinner, or tea she could not tell which, and now she was waiting with expectation, if not anxiety. But at the same time she knew she was quite sure of her lodger, because she held his banknote. It had been a dull day. There are many such in London, and therefore that was no singular circumstance. It was one of those dull, leaden-coloured days, of which you can predict nothing with certainty, or even a chance of being right. It was rather squally at times, and at others a west wind blew, not cold, at least not particularly so, but yet notwithstanding the heavy appearance of the sky, there was a clear white light that made every object look more disagreeable than ordinary. The landlady and her daughter were both on the qui vive, as it was called, looking out for their new lodger, whom they expected the more immediately as the evening drew on, for there was less likelihood of his coming in the middle of the day than towards the evening, and less after evening had set in than before, for he was an invalid. It was, they thought, just about the time when he must arrive, when there could only be the uncertainty of a few minutes. The whole house was in order. Nothing was left to chance. Mrs. Meredith herself had gone over the whole place, and took especial pains to find all sorts of fault with the unfortunate drudge who did the work, of course aided by the mother and daughter. But such aid was distressing, because she had to wait upon both and do her own work as well. However, all was in readiness, and they were looking out at every coach from between the blinds. The sound of wheels was enough to cause them to start, when suddenly a coach drove up to the door, upon which had been carefully packed several leather boxes and portmanteaus. "'Here he is,' said the daughter. "'Here he is.' "'Yes, and as I am alive,' said Mrs. Meredith, as she cast her eye upwards towards the next house, "'as I am alive, there is that girl again. I do believe that she does it on purpose. It is done to aggravate me, and to attract attention from the men. The hussy!' There was now no time to lose the knocker at the door giving pretty clear indication that instant attention upon their part was requisite, and up jumped Mrs. Meredith and her daughter Margaret. Immediately the servant opened the door into the passage, the coach-door was opened, the steps let clattering down, and Colonel Deverell entered the house. "'Will you walk into the parlour, Colonel?' inquired Mrs. Meredith. "'Until your boxes are all let in, and you see they are all correct, there is a good fire.' "'Thank you, madam,' said the colonel, with some difficulty walking along. "'I am scarcely so well able to walk as I was yesterday.' "'Ah, colonel, you must have suffered much. But I am glad the parlour is so handy. It will save you the walk upstairs at present, until you are quite recovered from your fatigue. Pray be seated, colonel, by the fire. The man shall bring them in and lay them before the door.' "'Thank you,' said the colonel and he sat down in a large easy-chair, having first dropped his cloak, which was a large blue military cloak, lined with white, with a fur collar, and looked extremely rich and handsome, beneath which he wore an officer's undress frock, covered over with a profusion of braid. The boxes and portmanteaus were brought in, and laid down so the colonel could see them, and when that was done, the coachman made his demand, which excited an exclamation of horror from Mrs. Meredith, and a declaration that she thought hackney coachmen were the greatest impostors and extortioners under the sun. There never was such a set as hackney coachmen, never. 
"'Saving lodging housekeepers, mum. "'Axing your pardon for saying so. "'Not that I means any offence, "'only I lived in one once, and ought to know some it. "'The colonel, however, made no remark, "'but pulling out an embroidered purse "'which appeared to be full of gold, "'he paid the man his demand. "'Thank you, Your Honour. "'You are one of the right sort, and no mistake.' So saying, the coachman walked away, jinking the money as he walked along the passage, until he came to the door where the girl was standing, and then, giving her a knowing wink and jerking his head backwards, he said, "'They are a scaly lot here, ain't they, Mary?' "'Mary!' screamed Margaret. "'Yes, miss.' "'Shut the door and come away from that insolent fellow!' Slam went the door. And then the servant went downstairs, and the parlour door was immediately closed, and the colonel was given into the tender mercies of the lodging housekeeper. For though she pretended that she merely offered a genteel and presentable house for such as desired it, and could afford to pay for it, she was, in every sense of the word, a lodging housekeeper. The colonel, however, sat very composedly in his chair, and gazed at the fire in silence, and from time to time he gazed at the mother and daughter with his one eye. He had not lost the entire use of the other, but had a green silk shade over it. He watched what went on, and replied cautiously to what was said to him, but appeared inclined to silence, and occasionally abrupt in his conversation. But this they attributed to the habit he must have been in when abroad of commanding. "'Will you take tea at once, Colonel, or at what hour do you choose to have it?' "'I will take it at once. I am tired.' "'What will you take, sir?' inquired Margaret at one end of the table, and placing herself in an enticing posture, she awaited the answer, expecting to be looked at. Coffee, said the colonel abruptly. There was a pause, but Margaret said nothing more, and set about doing such little matters as appeared to be an employment. But it was a mere deception. It was all done. Nothing had been left undone. They had taken care of that, as the servant knew full well. However, there was little that passed of any peculiar character on that occasion, for the evening passed off very calmly and comfortable, the colonel giving his opinion somewhat dogmatically, but that, of course, was submitted to, as he was a military man and had much experience, and moreover he was a rich man, quite a nabob. It is astonishing, as a general rule, what people will submit to when it comes from those who have riches at command. That fact alone seems to stamp all that is foolish and absurd coming from such a quarter with sense and worth. It is in vain for any one not blessed with property to talk. His talking is nothing in comparison with what falls from the lips of the man who has property. You are talked down, and if you are obstinate and won't be talked down, why you are a disagreeable fellow, a dissatisfied man, and your neighbors ought to set their faces against you. Thus through life. He who does not submit to the wealthy is always run down, and there is every disposition, if possible, of running him off the road altogether, no matter how great the injustice against him, and the enormity of the conduct of others. They are, as they think, justified, because he is not a genteel person. In fact, he is not evangelical. The evening passed over, as we have said, in calmness and quiet, and Mrs. Meredith appeared to be well pleased with her lodger and at a moderately early hour they separated and went to bed. The colonel retired after taking leave of them to his own room, complaining he was in great pain and scarce able to walk, and so cold he was nearly benumbed. "'This climate,' he said, "'is so cold, so moist, and altogether so uncomfortable that I cannot understand how it is people ever endure it. Indeed,' he continued to Mrs. Meredith, there must be some great difference between rich and poor in their confirmation, else they couldn't stand it. Of course, Mrs. Meredith assented to the proposition, as she would have done to any other, no matter what proposition, that had been so urged by such a person. Thus it was with the colonel, who appeared very well satisfied with his lodgings, and all parties for so short a time were well pleased with each other. The night was dark. That is to say, it was one of those nights in which neither moon nor stars showed themselves. No sound was heard through the streets, save the heavy step of the guardian of the night, or the midnight reveller, who might be finding his way homeward boisterously, and with scarce enough sense to enable him to take the right path. 
there were clouds enough to have intercepted the moon. But there was a kind of light that was spread through them that you saw when you looked up, but which aided not the traveller below. But then there were countless lamps that illumined the streets. At that time there was a man creeping over the housetops. He had gained the housetop of Mr. Smith, the house in which resided Miss Smith, who had given so much offence to Mrs. Meredith by sitting so much out in the balcony. He stooped in the gutter, and looked cautiously around. No human being was within sight. He was alone, and no soul saw him. Cautiously he crept towards the trap-door. It was bolted, but that was soon obviated. No sound, however, could be heard. The soft but rotten wood gave way under the steady pressure exerted upon the door which at length opened. He paused a moment or two, and listened carefully for several minutes. Then he entered the loft, slowly and noiselessly, keeping as low as possible, so that he might run no risk of being observed by any one who might be passing the house, or who might be up by accident in any of the opposite houses, in consequence of illness or any other cause. There was a lower trap-door through which the figure passed. There could be no difficulty in passing, because that was always kept open, as it was considered to assist in ventilating the house. And then the intruder stood within the house. He then drew himself up to his full height, and paused for some moments, as if considering the next step he would take. But then he descended to the second floor on which were placed what are called the best bedrooms. He paused at one, gently tried the handle, and finding it turn and the door open, he gave one look towards the stairs that he had just descended, and then he entered the apartment. All was yet still. No sound met his ear, save the breathing of the sleeper within, who lay in a sweet sleep and was as calm and unconscious as the blessed. Perfect rest and forgetfulness had steeped the senses of the young girl, who lay in ambrosial sleep. One arm was thrown outside the clothes, and revealed in all its symmetry a snow-white bosom, heaving gently to the throbbing of the heart. The intruder gazed at the young girl for some moments, and clasped his hands with trembling eagerness, and a ghastly smile played upon his terrible features, while a fearful fire shot from the eyes of one who thus disturbed the slumbers of the living. He approached the bed, and took the hand within his own, and then the sleeper awoke. It would be impossible to describe the look of terror and horror that sat on the young girl's face. She could not scream. She could not utter a sound. Her whole faculties appeared to have been bound up for a short time. She could not even shrink from the horrible being who approached her. She was so perfectly horror-stricken with that truly horrible countenance, the glance of which seemed as if it would destroy the power of speech forever. She shrank now, but could not move. The creature crept closer. It seized her hand, and held it within its own. But even that could not awake her from the trance she was in. She felt a horrible sinking feeling, as though she must sink through the very flooring of the house, and yet she could not stir. It appeared as though, so long as the hideous face was opposed to hers, so long she was unable to move. It was a species of fascination, however great the horror felt yet there was no help for it. She could not ever shut her eyes. That boon was denied her. What she saw cannot be described. It is by far too horrible for pen to describe. The wild, horrible insanity that appeared in the eyes of the creature, with their peculiar cast, was indescribable. The only light that entered the room, at that moment, came from a lamp below and illumined only the upper part of the room above the window-sills. 
the creature then stood in relief against this light. A horrible, dark object, whose glaring eyeballs were too terrible ever to be forgotten. Then again, while he with one hand held hers, he passed his other hand up her arm, and then felt along the soft white flesh with its cold, clammy fingers, as if it were feeling for something, or greedy of the velvet-like substance. Still keeping the eyes fixed upon the hapless and helpless girl, he drew the arm towards him, and leaning upon the bed, suddenly plunged his face on the arm, and held and seized it near the middle with his teeth, and then it made an attempt to suck the wound. This, however, broke the charm, horrible and complete as it was, for the creature's hideous countenance was lost to her sight as he plunged his face to her arm. Shriek followed shriek in quick and rapid succession. The whole house was alarmed by the terrible shrieks that came from the apartment. She struggled, and by a sudden effort she disengaged herself from the grasp of the fiend, and rolled, wrapped up in the bedclothes, to the other side of the floor. The monster still pursued her with greedy thirst for blood, and had picked her up, and again placed her on the bed with more than mere human strength, and again sought the arm he had been deprived of by the sudden effort of the young girl. "'Help! Help! Mother! Father! Help! Help!' The shouts rang through the house, awaking the affrighted sleepers from the repose in a manner that may be called distressing. It is distressing in the midst of a large city to be awoke, in the dead of the night, by loud and urgent cries of distress. It is such a contrast to the dead stillness that reigns around, and when the first cries are heard, it creates a terror and surprise that takes away all power of action. It was not till the cries had been heard a second time that the inmates aroused themselves. The fact was, they were fearful of fire. The moment that idea floated across their minds, then indeed they started up, and the father of the young girl, hearing the fall, at once rushed to the room of his daughter. He arrived but in time. The hideous monster, being affrighted by the footsteps approaching him, turned from his blood-stained feast, and hid himself beneath the drapery as the father entered the room. "'Mary,' he said, "'Mary, Mary, what means this? What can be the matter? Are you hurt? How come you in this disorder?' Oh, God! That thing from the grave has been sucking my blood from my veins. See, see yonder, he moves. Watch him, note him, father. Believing she raved, her father paid no attention to what she did say, but continued to regard her with sorrow and regret, for he believed it to be a sudden attack of mania. But seeing the curtains move, he turned his head, and at once divined it to be the cause of his daughter's alarm. The glance was but momentary, but he saw the figure of a man who was escaping from the apartment by the door by which he had at that moment entered. "'Help!' he shouted. "'Help! Thieves! Murder!' And as he shouted, he rushed after the figure that was flying towards the top of the house. By this time the house was filled up with people, and the noise upstairs had caused the servants below to rise confused and thoroughly terrified by the sounds they heard, and the cries of their master. At that moment one of those watchful guardians of the night passed by the house, and was immediately hailed by the unfortunate people below, who were afraid to go upstairs to offer any assistance, lest they might be knocked back again, which fear stopped all aid from below. Hello, "'What's the matter now?' inquired the worthy guardian of the night. "'Oh, I don't know. Goodness knows. You had better go up and see. I'll come up after you. Don't be afraid. I'll come up after you if you'll go first. "'Stop a moment while I spring my rattle,' said the worthy functionary, who thereupon gave an alarming peal upon his instrument, and then he entered the house, with instructions to the servant to run downstairs and let any of his party in that might come up. Then the guardian of the night hastened upstairs with all the haste he could, and came up just in time to pick Mr. Smith up, who was lying stunned at the foot of the stairs. The fact was, Mr. Smith had pursued his adversary too quickly, and finding he could not get off, he turned round and felled him to the earth like an ox. It was just at this juncture when the Charlie came upstairs, and in another moment Mr. Smith recovered. "'What's the matter?' inquired the watchman. 
Is the house on fire? No, no, the vampire, the vampire. Eh, hey, what? Never heard of him before, never seed him. Quick, quick, he has gone upstairs. Quick, after him, said Mr. Smith, as he ran up the stairs, and was quickly followed by the watchman and some others who now crowded about, having had time to dress themselves and come to Mr. Smith's aid, and they now crowded to the housetop, for they saw the trap-door was unfastened, though it had been hastily pushed to. This they opened, and then looked on the housetop, first one way, and then another. "'He ain't here,' said the watchman, "'and we mustn't expect to find him here. He wouldn't wait for us, you may depend upon that. We had better search along the housetops till we see him, or find some of the other traps open, and then you may guess where he has gone.' "'The difficulty is which way did he go?' said Mr. Smith. "'Oh, I saw him go that way,' said another watchman, who came upstairs, having been first attracted by the sounds of the rattle, and then, looking up at the house, he saw the figure of a man stealing with great rapidity of motion across the housetops. "'There I lost him, then,' he said. "'I didn't see him after that spot, but he may have gone further for all I can say to the contrary, but we shall soon see.' "'This trap-door is open,' said the other watchman as he pulled aside Mrs. Meredith's trap-door, which had only been pushed to. "'We had better go in here, and see if he isn't gone somewhere into the house, and hiding himself till all is quiet, and then he will make off if left alone.'" End of chapter 128 Recording by Barony Chapter 129 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 129 The Unsuccessful Pursuit, Mr. Smith's Disappointment and the testimony of Mrs. Meredith. Mrs. Meredith and her daughters had long sunk into deep sleep before the events just narrated took place in her neighbor's house. There was a perfect stillness. The whole house appeared as though there were no living soul within it. All was so still and quiet. Presently, however, there was a terrific sound. It was like that of a human being falling and bumping downstairs and then there was a great deal of shouting and calling, and Mrs. Meredith opened her eyes and trembled in her bed, while her daughter Margaret, who upon the occasion slept with her, was likewise as frightened. "'What is the that?' she stammered, with some difficulty. "'Oh, here, I cannot think. Thieves, murderers, I dare say. Oh, merciful heaven, what shall we do? Where shall I go? We shall be murdered!' Both females trembled in their beds and were quite unable to move, breaking out in a profuse sweat from fear. And yet the noise came nearer and nearer, and there were many persons evidently in the house. Their numbers were so numerous that they evidently didn't care to conceal themselves. The fact was this. When Mr. Smith and his party found the trap-door open, they descended into the house, the watchman leading the way. But in going down the ladder his foot slipped, and he came with a dreadful thump on the landing and fortunately he rolled up against the servant-girl's door instead of downstairs. The door flew open, and the girl was too terrified to speak for some moments. At length, the watchman having got up, he made for the bed, upon which the girl jumped up and began to scream out for help in piteous tones. "'Come, come, don't be frightened,' said the watchman. "'Get up and show us over the house.' "'Well, I'm sure.' said the girl, who had recovered some of her assurance, for the coat, stick, and lantern of the watchman at once assured her that she was in no immediate danger whatever. "'Well, I'm sure. To think of coming in a female's room in this manner. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you old wretch, you ought.' "'No names. If you don't get up and show us over and call your master—' "'I ain't got a master.' "'Well, your mistress, then. We will go ourselves, and we'll soon make short work of it.' "'Come, come, no nonsense. We will dress you ourselves.' "'You monster! Go out of the room, can't you? Have you no decency left you? I'll get up, but I'll lay a complaint before the Lord Mayor, and he shall tell you a different tale to this. 
I am ashamed of you, and so you ought to be of yourselves. However, during this energetic remonstrance, she contrived to shuffle on some things, and when she was ready, she came down to her mistress's door, and then began to hammer and kick at it, saying, "'Oh, Miss Meredith, there's such a lot of men in the house. Do come out, ma'am. I don't know what's the matter, but they'll break into your room as they broke into mine. What do they want, Mary? Don't know, ma'am. "'There is some one escaped into your house that has broken into the next house, and your trap-doors on the roof were open.' "'Gracious me!' said Mrs. Meredith. "'Gracious me! Show them over the place, Mary. We shall get up in a few moments and come to you. Margaret, my dear, get up. Some housebreakers have gotten into the house, and we shall all be murdered in our sleep if we don't find them. Oh, dear, dear, what will become of us? What will our new lodger say to this disturbance?' Margaret made no reply, but began to dress herself, while the party began their search, and Mr. Smith hastened back to his daughter, to understand the nature of the attack that had been made upon her, and whether she were any better than she was when he left her. However, when he came to hear what was the real cause of her terror, to find the marks upon her arm, and the certainty that nothing had been lost or moved, he was perfectly staggered, and hastened back after the party he had left, to make some further attempt to follow the miscreant, and to discover, if possible, his retreat, and bring him to justice for the vile attack he had made. When he returned, he met Mrs. Meredith coming out of her room, she having hastily dressed herself, followed by her daughter. "'Oh, Mr. Smith! Mr. Smith, what is the meaning of all this disturbance? Here are a number of strange men who have forced themselves into my house, and whether their object is our property or our lives we cannot tell. What can I do, Mr. Smith?' "'You have nothing to fear, ma'am.' "'Nothing to fear, sir?' Why, is not such an occurrence something to be feared for its own sake alone? Yes, ma'am, it is very disagreeable, I am willing to admit, but I presume you would not give refuge to a vampire. A what, sir? A vampire, madam. I know not how to explain it to you, but I have to assure you my daughter has been attacked in her sleep by the midnight bloodsucker from the graves. Oh, God, that such a thing should happen in my family. I would not have believed it had the same been related to me from anybody else. It must have been the nightmare, suggested Mrs. Meredith. Would to heaven it had been so. But I came to her assistance, and saw him as he fled from my daughter's bedside, and I followed him to the roof, and he was lost on your house, and your trap-door was open, and we presumed he went in here. "'The door was bolted when we went to bed last night,' said Margaret. "'Yes,' responded her mother. "'We always have that bolted every night, for it is our only protection from that side of the house. But no one can be here. We have no man in the house save our lodger, an invalid and quite a gentleman. Can we see him?' "'I should think not, because he is an invalid. He is a colonel in the East India service, and will no doubt be very angry at such a disturbance.' and much more so when he finds he is wanted. I am really much shocked at this disturbance, which is the more unfortunate, as it is the first night he has slept here. I must see him. Must, Mr. Smith, must! I cannot permit anything of the kind to be said in my house. I give you permission to look for him over the house, but I can't give any such permission with what my lodgers possess. It is not in my power to do so, if I had the inclination." While this was going on, the house had been rummaged over and over, and then a party of them, with Mr. Smith, came to the Colonel's bedroom. A close travelling cap and a dressing gown were found on the mat before the door. "'Oh,' said Mr. Smith, as he picked it up, "'this appears very much like what I saw the figure was dressed up in, something like robes, and this would serve the purpose.' "'Ah,' said the watchman, "'we shall have him now.' "'But the gentleman is an invalid. "'He can hardly walk upstairs, much less can he be scrambling over housetops,' said Mrs. Meredith. "'You must surely all have been dreaming. "'Something has disagreed with you, and the result has been visions of which you can, of course, find no trace.' "'Not quite that either,' said one of the watchmen. "'For we saw him getting away, and he made for your trap-door, where I missed him. "'I could not see any more of him among the chimneys, or something of that sort, "'but I thought he came in here, and found your door open.' "'And you saw him come in?' said Mrs. Meredith. 
"'I can't say I saw him come in,' said the man. "'I couldn't see through a brick wall and a stack of chimneys which were in the way, "'but I felt certain he must have come in here. "'Well, this is very strange, very singular.' "'The dressing-gown, too,' said Mr. Smith, "'is dusty and dirty all over, "'at least in places where it appears to have come in contact with anything dirty, "'possibly the roof of the house. "'Certainly something of that sort has happened. "'It looks very much like it.' "'And the cap sits close to the head. That is dirty.' "'But it is dry dirt,' said Mr. Smith, "'and of the same character. "'We had better see this lodger of yours, Mrs. Meredith, "'and with your permission I will knock.' "'As Mr. Smith spoke, he gave two or three loud knocks at the door, "'which were not answered for some time, "'but they were speedily repeated, "'and then a peremptory voice exclaimed, "'In the name of goodness, what is the meaning of all this disturbance?' Is a house broken into, or is it a resort for thieves? Be it as it may, if I am disturbed in this way, and you don't instantly get out of the way and make less noise, I'll fire through the door. I have loaded pistols by my side, and I will not submit to the shameful disturbance. At the sound of these words, the two watchmen were much disturbed, and immediately stepped back so hastily as nearly to overthrow Mrs. Meredith and her daughter. But Mr. Smith, after a step or two backwards, resumed his place by the door, and exclaimed, "'I have not come here, sir, to be frightened. Some strange circumstances have just happened, and I must beg you'll open the door to explain them. And who the devil are you?' "'My name is Smith, sir. I live next door, and my daughter has been attacked by a vampire. I know not what nature the creature must possess, but it has shocking propensities. There are evidences at your door which make it appear he has got into your room.' "'It would be very foolish in him to do anything of the sort,' said the Colonel. "'For in the first place, I will not suffer annoyance in any shape. "'And besides, I have loaded pistols for his reception. "'Wait till I am dressed, and then I will come out to you.' "'I am sure the Colonel will be very much offended by this conduct, "'which is very shameful. "'People's houses broken open and entered in this manner, "'and people's rest broken, so I am quite ashamed of my neighbours, quite.' "'Really, we have strong suspicions, strong grounds of suspicion, too, against that lodger of yours. Look at that dressing-gown and cap, the open trap-door and all. Really, I can't help thinking there is something very suspicious in all this.' "'Yes,' said the watchman. "'I know there's nobody else in the house. I've been all over it, and it's very strange to me if he ain't the man.' "'Well,' said Margaret Meredith, "'It seems as if you are most willing to accuse those who are quite incapable of doing what you accuse them of. This gentleman was barely able to get upstairs without assistance. Besides, he could not have gone upstairs without someone being awoke by the noise. It's my opinion that this is a piece of impertinence altogether.' "'So I think, my dear,' said Mrs. Meredith. "'I am a father, Mrs. Meredith,' said Mr. Smith and I have my daughter's safety and happiness at heart. I am sure there's much too very suspicious. You wouldn't like your daughter's blood sucked out of her arms. I am sure I don't, nor does she. Oh, botheration, said Margaret. Who ever heard of such stuff? I'm sure I never did, except in some book of improbabilities and nothing more. But here is Colonel Deverell. At that moment, Colonel Deverell opened the door, and then retired a little into his room, saying as he did so in a very angry voice, but at the same time endeavouring to be courteous. "'You can come in now, but I am quite at a loss to understand the nature of this disturbance. The house doesn't appear to be on fire, and that is the only contingency in my mind that will justify such a disturbance. What is the matter, Mrs. Meredith?' "'I can hardly tell you, sir. I have been disturbed by finding a party of people in my house. It is most amazing to me how they came in.' "'I will tell you, sir,' said Mr. Smith. "'My daughter has been terrified by the appearance of someone in her bedroom, who attempted to suck her blood from the veins of her arm. I don't know what to say about it.' "'I am sure I don't,' said Colonel Deverell. "'But I must say it's a most unpleasant affair for those who have nothing to do with it. It is a pity your domestic affliction should call you out in this manner. Take my advice, sir. Go home, else you'll catch cold.' "'You may repent making a jest of this. "'I never repent anything, sir. "'I regret I am so unnecessarily disturbed, "'and it appears to me your intrusion here is most unwarrantable.' "'Is this your dressing-gown, sir?' "'Yes, it is.' 
"'Well, then, how did it come here, and in this state?' inquired Mr. Smith triumphantly. "'I don't know. I didn't put it there. But I suppose it must have fallen accidentally. It would not have been thrown there willingly,' said the Colonel, deliberately. "'Well, I don't know,' said Mr. Smith. "'But it strikes me you've been on the tiles this evening.' "'My good sir, if you don't leave my apartment, it may happen I may forget my pains and lameness, and fling you out of the window. If this had happened in India, instead of here, you would have had a particularly sharp knife inserted between your ribs, or have been thrown into a well. But I know nothing of this matter, which appears so strange as to be beyond all reason. Neither experience nor common sense at all throw any light upon the matter. Be advised, sir, and retire, and allow honest people and invalids to sleep the night out. Mr. Smith looked very blank, and unable to comprehend all that had passed, he could not tell what to think. He could not urge the matter further, for he was met by real contempt and perfect self-assurance on the part of the Colonel, who moved about the room very lame, while his hand was in a sling, and a green shade was placed over his eyes. "'You see,' said Mrs. Meredith, "'you must be very entirely mistaken. Colonel Deverell, we are sure, is quite unable to run about over housetops, even if he had the inclination to do so, which is really absurd. It must be at least a great mistake on your part. Yes, I am sure, too, Colonel Deverell could not have left the house without our knowing it. Indeed, it is a very silly affair, and has been a great nuisance, to say the least of it. I wonder Mr. Smith doesn't know better than to break into peaceable people's houses. But I did not do so. "'How came you here, then? I followed some one else. The place was open, and yet you say it was shut at night, and usually kept so. How do you account for that? I cannot do so, unless some neglect took place, or else you must have forced it open.' "'Oh, no, ma'am,' said the watchman. "'I can swear Muster Smith didn't do that. It was open, and I found it so. So there's that to be accounted for. And then there's the togs a lying outside here. That's to be accounted for. So you see, it's a weary suspicious case.' "'You are a very stupid fellow,' said the Colonel. "'A very idiot, if you imagine people are to be held responsible "'because a dressing-gown happens to fall down. "'I do not know, but I shall proceed with this matter myself. "'It seems to me you have committed a trespass, to say the least of it. "'I can pledge my word, as a man of honour and a soldier, "'I have not left my room. "'Indeed, these ladies know I could not do so, "'and their testimony would be ample in a court of justice, and to a gentleman.' "'Yes, that is no more than the truth,' said Mrs. Meredith, who was by no means pleased with the disturbance, and because she had no sympathy for the young lady who sat in the balcony to the annoyance of herself and her daughter. "'And I can bear witness to the same,' said Miss Meredith. "'I think it is quite time Mr. Smith returned to his own place, and see what is the matter there. Perhaps the person he saw may have passed him and gone back again into his own house.' Mr. Smith lingered looked wistfully, as if his doubts were not cleared off. But yet the testimony was so clear and so strong that he could not dispute it. And however unwillingly he was compelled to acknowledge, there were some matters that he could not dispute, though he was unable to solve them. And he and those with him returned from their unsatisfactory search. End of chapter 129 Recording by Barony Chapter 130 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 130 A Breakfast Scene, A Matchmaking Mother. The next day there was some anxiety on the part of Mrs. Meredith to ascertain how far her new lodger might have been disturbed by this event, and in what temper of mind he felt upon the occasion. It is usual in all lodgings to have some little regard to the lodger's comforts for some days, perhaps a week or two, and then things are allowed to take their chance, and if the lodger complains, he gets for an answer that they take a vast deal of pains to oblige him, and intimate that he is a peculiarly lucky man for having become a lodger at that place 
and you would have been worse off if you had gone elsewhere, which, of course, you don't believe, though they tell you so. It is an old and favorite saying that a new broom sweeps clean, and, in time, an old one becomes very nearly useless. So it is with lodging-house keepers. The longer you remain, the more inattentive they become, until you get wearied and are compelled to leave, and then you get some scurvy insolence, and your landlady eventually believes she is an ill-used woman. But in the present instance, Mrs. Meredith had other hopes and fears than those of a mere lodging-house keeper. Not that she had formed any plan in her own mind, but she had some floating idea that there was seldom such a chance turned up, because the colonel had evidently no relations, and who could tell what, in the chapter of accidents, might happen. "'I am quite grieved,' she said to her daughter. "'It should have happened this night. What could be the meaning of the disturbance, I can't think. Now it's very tiresome things will happen so cross as this, that I don't know what to think of it.' It really appears as if it was done on purpose. It does, but I am sorry for it, because it would seem as though we were liable to some kind of interruption at all times, for they generally expect attention at the first, if at no other time, and he may think this is a bad beginning at all events. But we shall convince him that we shall not treat him neglectfully, Ma. No, my dear, but these Indians are strange-tempered people, and when they once take a fancy— there is no knowing what they may do, and there is no knowing what a dislike taken at such an occurrence might produce, and likes and dislikes are taken without rhyme or reason. Yes, Ma, so they are, and that is the reason why you took such a dislike to young Willis, for he was as nice a young man as I have seen. Nice, my dear, nice. I don't see why he was nice unless it was because he was presumptuous and had no money, said the amiable parent. He was not rich, Ma. He was positively poor, Margaret, interrupted the mother, and therefore it was absolutely necessary to discourage such persons, for, if they do no good, they are sure to be productive of mischief, for their hanging about, you know, determines others from coming forward who have means. He was very handsome. Handsome is as handsome does, my dear. You'll find that is a motto through life that will carry weight at any time. All the good looks in the world would never put a gown on your back or a sixpence in your purse, recollect. Besides, he was not handsome. You are prejudiced against the young man. Not that I care anything about him, though he was a very agreeable and nice young man. So it's no use in saying that he wasn't. Well, my dear, it doesn't much matter. This is a matter of opinion. What do you think of our colonel? He is a fine man and a rich one besides. He is tall, I admit, but stoops a great deal, is very lame, one eye much worse than the other, and one arm in a sling. Well, I can't see much beauty in all that, much out of repair, you must admit, Ma. Yes, Colonel Deverell has seen some service, and his misfortunes are so many points of honor. They are like so many medals which speak of his worth. Besides that, he is a most gentlemanly and pleasant man." I don't know that I ever spoke to a more fascinating man. That might be at times, but then that was evidently a constraint upon his natural temper, because he every now and then broke out abruptly about something or other, which proves that he has an abrupt and imperious temper, not to say savage and snappish. There you are clearly unjustifiable, my dear Margaret. The colonel, you see, is a military man, and used to command and therefore it is a very usual occurrence, and not a matter of disposition at all. But what can that matter when you come to consider his wealth? There is certainly room for congratulation there, said Margaret. Indeed, my child, there is room for congratulation, and I am convinced there is happiness where there is a fortune, for that will obtain all you want, and, when you obtain all you want, what can you be otherwise than entirely happy? Therefore, riches are happiness. Yes, there is much truth in all that, Ma, said Margaret, and all I hope is that I might obtain a fortune. Then I would make you comfortable, Ma. I'm sure you would, Margaret. My whole life has been spent in ships to maintain you and bring you up in a manner that would enable you to become a fortune, which, thanks to my care, example, and precept, 
you are fully equal to at any moment it may become your lot. Yes, ma, I feel that I was born to command, and the lady of a colonel would not be a bit too high in rank for my ambition or deserts. Indeed it would not, my dear, but now listen to me. You know, my dear, I never plan anything but what is for your benefit. Now I am given to understand that Colonel Deverell has no relatives at all, and I think hardly any friends, and that we can make ourselves quite necessary to him, in fact, perfect friends to him. He will look upon us as his nearest relatives, and he may take a fancy to you, as you may easily induce him. Old men like flattery, there is no doubt, and that kind of flattery which is called attention. Wait upon him most assiduously, and read to him, and all that kind of thing, my dear. Yes, I know, ma. And then, dear, if you mind what you are about, the colonel and all his wealth may be yours before six months are over, or I'm no witch. Hush, I hear him stirring. He's coming downstairs. There he is in the drawing-room. I hear him overhead. Go upstairs, my dear, and inquire when he will choose to have his breakfast. Yes, ma, said the young lady, who betrayed an extraordinary desire to obey her parent, a matter not equally to be said of all young ladies, nor of this one upon many occasions. But then this was one that was quite agreeable to her own feelings, which explains the secret. Colonel Deverell had, indeed, descended, and was seated in the drawing-room, with his feet on the fender and his head leaning on his hand and his elbow on the table, when Margaret entered. He appeared to be thoughtful and unwell. He had, perhaps, passed a bad night, or the interruption had robbed him of his sleep, which to an invalid was the more severely felt. "'Good morning, Colonel,' said Margaret, advancing. "'I hope the disturbance that so inopportunely took place did not have the effect of destroying your night's rest.' "'Indeed, it did do so to a very great extent,' replied the Colonel, "'though not entirely. "'But still it makes one very poorly, gives one the headache, "'and causes a sense of lassitude and fatigue to oppress the body, "'which, added to the weariness incident to such cases, "'makes one very uncomfortable. "'I am sorry you have been so discomposed, and so is my ma. "'She really is grieved. "'But you see, sir, it was a matter so entirely beyond any control "'that she cannot be blamed for it, though it happened most unfortunately, "'at a time when it was least wanted or most to be avoided.' True, very true, I can imagine all that. I am not unjust enough to blame you for it. I could no more help it than you could, and I dare say you were none the better for such a disagreeable disturbance. I am not, I am very certain. No, sir, I am not. When would you please to breakfast? As soon as I can have it, replied the colonel. You can have it at once. Then be pleased to let me have it. I have the use of but one arm entirely. May I beg your aid in making tea for me? With pleasure, sir. Margaret immediately left the room and informed her mother of what had passed upon the occasion, and when the breakfast was laid and all things ready, Margaret Meredith sat down with Colonel Deverell to breakfast. Before, however, they had gone far, he inquired if she had breakfasted. No, I have not. And your mother, has she breakfasted? No, sir, she has not. Then give her my compliments, and I shall be glad to take breakfast in her company, too, for I am very poorly this morning, and company is agreeable. This was soon effected, and in a few minutes more they all sat down, the colonel being duly waited upon by Margaret and her mother, the latter being employed in aiding the former to pay great attention to their host, for they breakfasted at his expense as a matter of course. It was really a most unfortunate occurrence, that of last night, said Mrs. Meredith. Very unfortunate, because some people have a difficulty in sleeping in a strange bed, and when once awake, they cannot easily, if at all, get asleep again, and that I had great fears might have been your case. Not precisely, said the colonel, but the fact is, I have seen so much hard service, that I can sleep anywhere without any effort of mine but when one has suffered from wounds, the heats of climate, and the terrors of imprisonments in Indian prisons, one's health becomes so shattered that one's rest is not so good as it ought to be. But that is no one's fault. 
it is a grievous misfortune said mrs meredith yes added margaret and i think there is not enough gratitude in the country towards those who so nobly defend us in our homes to do which they must not only brave danger and death in the field of battle but all the evils that spring from climate insidious diseases brought on by the exposures and hardships of a soldier's life and then when they see them return to their own country with wounds that ought to bring honor glory and sure profit they are omitted and neglected the colonel sighed deeply, but said nothing. "'My dear Miss Meredith, will you fetch me my keys? I left them in the bureau.' "'Yes, sir,' said the amiable young lady, who arose and left the room. "'Your daughter is an amiable girl, Mrs. Meredith,' said Colonel Deverell. "'She reminds me of one who is now dead, and at whose decease I left England for India. The country became insupportable to me at that time.' but she now recalls all the feelings and aspirations of youth. Ah, she is an amiable and good girl, though I am her mother. Yet I must not do her less than justice, because it is usual to consider it partial or silly of a parent praising her own child, but she does deserve all that can be said of her. It is a blessing. There was the same class of beauty and the same amiable and sensible deportment. Oh, dear, those days are gone by, indeed. Who knows, but they may return. It is doubtful, more than doubtful, certain. I am an old man now, Mrs. Meredith, an old man. Yes, I have deserved some thanks at the hands of my country, and I am rich. Yes, Mrs. Meredith, I am rich, very rich, I believe I may say. That is some reward. It is, but I cannot recall the past. I am no longer young. I have no young wife by my side, to soothe my pillow, to attend to my wants. No, I am an old man, as I said before, and I cannot expect the attention of the young and beautiful. But, Colonel Deverell, you are not an old man, and as for your wounds, they are honorable. But my shattered constitution may be mended by care and attention, doubtless and I am sure while you are here you shall want no attention we can possibly bestow. I thank you, Mrs. Meredith, I thank you, said the colonel. I only regret the disturbance you suffered last night, said Mrs. Meredith. I am afraid want of proper rest has made you melancholy. I knew not of such a thing, neither was I at all aware of the fact of the trap-door being open. Indeed, I can't understand it. Nor I, ma'am, I do not clearly understand what they said. They talked of some young lady being strangled or assaulted in her sleep. Yes, Colonel, it was in her sleep, and I cannot help thinking it must have been a dream. However, if it were not, I do not know what to think of it. Nor I, said the Colonel thoughtfully. They talked about a vampire, and said Miss Smith had been seized by the arm, and the creature had attempted to suck the blood from the veins. Dear me, what a strange affair! Very, sir, but I never heard of such things only in books, but goodness help us from such strange unearthly beings. Have you seen any in your travels, Colonel Deverell? You have travelled in hot countries, and have seen them, I should imagine. Not I, Mrs. Meredith. I have seen strange things, but I never saw a vampire, though I have heard of such things. Indeed, there are many disgusting things in creation, and that is one of them. But what could be the reason they should come to that young lady above any other, I cannot conceive. Nor I, sir. At this moment Margaret returned, having recovered the keys, which were not wanted. Only the watchful mamma thought there was an opportunity for a little tender gag relative to the amiability of the young lady, and therefore it ought not to be omitted. Moreover, she saw that there was no necessity for leaving them alone yet, there would be plenty of time yet for that, and she felt assured there would be ample opportunity for the progress of the suit she now confidently anticipated must take place, for she saw, however prompt and ready the colonel might be from habit, yet there was a good deal of the willing mood about him. His health and weakness, she thought, causes that, and now, while his health lasts this way, he may be secured, or at least the foundation laid upon which we may build our hopes. He shall want no aid of mine to help him on that way. 
Have you been long in England, Colonel? she inquired. Not very long. The voyage homeward must have been very tedious. It would have been, but I did not come that way. I crossed into Egypt and came to the Mediterranean and thence to Italy. So I varied the scene and travelled at leisure and got here a month before the vessel I was to have come by. Oh, that was much more pleasant. Decidedly so. And then I came to the hotel. Not that I had not all proper attention paid me, but then there was no sociality there. Men only surround you with whom you can hold no converse whatever. Certainly not. They are menials. And of the lowest class. However, I sought out such a place as this, where I wished to have some of the domestic comforts around me that I might have had, had I a home of my own, some one to whom I could speak more seriously, for I am debarred the affectionate regard of near and dear female relatives. You must look upon us in that light, Colonel Deverell, as persons who are anxious and desirous of causing you to forget these wants by our assiduity and attention. I can speak for my daughter as myself, she will do all in her power to render your stay comfortable. She is young and beautiful. Ahem! And doubtless will change such occupations to those of a more endearing character. Well, it is as it should be, and I am selfish to feel jealous. I wish I was young myself. But enough of this. I have to express my obligation to you for the ready manner in which you came forward to speak of my being in my room last night, when that man was here and the watchmen. Mr. Smith? Yes, that was the man. They would not have taken my word for it. However, I hope to be able to remain here until I find myself sinking to the grave. And those who act as you have began to act for me, I must and will remember at my death and afterwards. I do not act with such a motive, Colonel Deverell. No, no, I am well aware of that but that renders it a duty in me. However, we will say no more now. I am even wearied out. End of chapter 130、chapter 131 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 131. Mrs. Meredith's Friend, Exchange of Services, and Compact. There could be no doubt in the minds of both mother and daughter that there was something much resembling a moral certainty concerning the fate of the retired colonel. That he must marry was evident. He was to all intents and purposes resolved to do so. He talked of a home and domestic comfort, and all that kind of thing. Therefore it would be easy to entangle him in the meshes of love. The snares of passion might be successfully set, and they would be sure to be productive of some sport, and even a stray colonel might be caught, one who, having had enough of wars of man, might now be considered to become a fair object of attack in those of Venus. However, there appeared much in the colonel's circumstances and disposition that laid him open to the attacks of designing matrons and maidens. He seemed to appreciate female company, was particularly well pleased with female attentions, perhaps his health required their aid more than that of any other, and he had evidently been in love and lost the object of his earliest affections. One great thing in Margaret Meredith's favor was, the colonel had taken it into his head that she much resembled this lady, whoever she was, and this fact, no doubt, had opened his heart towards her, and he felt a kindly and perhaps a warmer feeling towards her. This, they calculated, would greatly assist them in their efforts to circumvent the colonel and cause him to capitulate upon matrimonial conditions. There was never so good a chance, said Mrs. Meredith, in the course of a day or two after the above scene. There never was such a chance as the one you now have. What, with the colonel, ma? Yes, my love, you may depend upon it. That is a very safe speculation. Why, he must be immensely rich. I am sure that some of the jewels I have seen on his fingers must be worth thousands of pounds. He is a very rich man, there can be no doubt. 
Yes, Ma, he is very rich. And you will have many fine things that you have never dreamed of. Why, you will have a carriage. I should think he would never refuse you that trifle. He has not one now. Yes, that is true. He would never use it himself, and that accounts for it. But when he has a wife, it is quite another matter, and one which you can easily manage when you are a wife. You can do more then than you can now. Besides, you'll see how the money is spent, and it must all go through your hands, you know. That can't be helped. No, I dare say not. But, Ma, don't you think when he dies there will be a loss of the pension? And that would be a serious loss. It would, but then you will have a pension as an officer's widow, besides all his vast property, without any trouble whatever, with nobody to contradict you. That is, if he were to die. But I think he will not do that. He does not at times appear so old as one would think. And yet he is very pale. But that, I suppose, is caused by his long residence abroad in hot climates, and being exposed to the weather of all kinds, attended by wounds and sickness. No doubt he has suffered much, but he has obtained a handsome fortune, which pays for a great deal, you know, said Margaret. Undoubtedly, my dear. By the by, have you heard how that affair of Miss Smith has ended, and why they came in here in such a manner? Oh, it was a very shocking affair. There were some marks in her arm, which I cannot understand. It does seem very extraordinary to me. But she says she was awoke in the night by some monster sucking her blood. Dear me, who ever heard of such nonsense? I cannot but think there must have been something in it. And yet, what could have been the reason for them all to utter a falsehood, I don't know. There was, you know, the father, then the watchmen, all of whom said they saw it. At all events, they appeared to have some idea that it must have been done by someone in our house. The dressing gown in that appeared to bewilder them. Did they say they thought so still? No, they did not do that. We spoke so positive. And I saw when I went in to see her, she was much terrified at what had occurred, and could not get up. She had a physician to attend her, who will not hear of anything that she says. Well, I think he is right. But the whole family appeared to side with her, and insist that it was no robber who made the attempt, for nothing was gone, nothing was attempted in the shape of robbery, nothing was touched or moved. Therefore there could be no common motive, they said. Well, at all events, they have made somebody very disagreeable in the family, and they had better have been quiet, but they are a disagreeable set, and I shall not go in again. You are right, my dear, they would be glad to push that minx of theirs in here, and get an acquaintance with the colonel. No, it will be safest to keep them apart. We will have as few female visitors, my dear, as possible. Not that I think you run any chance of rivalry, but you know men are such uncertain things. To be sure they are, ma, replied Margaret. Well, then, if we have no female acquaintances, you see we cannot possibly run any risk, and the matter will not be so protracted, because everything depends upon things being smooth and uninterrupted. He will be the more ready to propose and push the matter to a point. Do you think him a likely man, Ma, to marry? Certain of it, my dear, quite certain of it. I know a marrying man as soon as I see him. The colonel is decidedly a marrying man. He talks of home, domestic comfort, and all that sort of thing. And when men do that, you may be sure, if you are cautious, to catch such an one. Well, I will try. Do, my dear, it will be worth your while, it will make all our fortunes. I wonder what his money is invested in. I should like to know that, said Margaret. And so should I. Do you know, I have been thinking of that myself more than once. It will be necessary to find it out, and yet it is so delicate a matter, that I think you had better make no attempt to work it out of him. Let the affair take its own course at present. But I can hear all. Then you will act wisely, my dear, very wisely, prudently, but do no more. Hear and see all, and say nothing. Of course, I mean upon that subject alone. Now, if we proceed cautiously, we shall be sure to gain our object. I will take some method of obtaining the information I want at some future time, 
because it will be well to have him caught before we begin to pull tight the line, or, at least, before we begin to make any inquiries respecting his means, he must give us some cause to do so. I dare say we shall know something by accident some of these days. Perhaps at the hotel where he comes from, something may be learned by inquiry. Possibly there may, my dear, but I do not like to go there. At all events, they can know but little, for he has not been long in England, and would hold but little communication with such people. We must have some better plan than that to go upon, else we shall never be successful, except at the cost of some cross in our hopes we would rather have avoided. Well, Ma, you shall do as you like in this affair. I am sure you will do what is right and best for the occasion. Besides, one plan is better than two. You are right, my dear. I am, however, resolved to have a visitor. A visitor, Ma? Yes, my dear, only Mr. Twistle, the attorney. Oh, I know who you mean now, but why do you have him? He is a very funny sort of acquaintance, especially if he is to meet the colonel. I wish to meet him, my dear, for that reason. He will be able to get out of him, by some means, what he has got his money locked up in. A hint will serve him, and he can make inquiries and learn it all, and then he will, if we are successful, have a good thing of marriage settlements, and so forth. Besides, I will make an agreement with him that he shall receive a sum of money for his trouble." That will be a very good plan, certainly. Exactly, and you needn't be seen in it at all. So I think we shall be all very fairly put in the way of doing well. I shall go out this morning and call upon Mr. Twistle and have some conversation with him. He used to have some business of your father's to do, and has had much of his money, as well as a good word now and then. Dear me, who is that? There is a double knock at the door, Ma. How vexing it will be to have any one come here. I shall hate the sight of any one coming in now. Can't you see from the window who it is, my dear? No, Ma. Then we must wait until the servant comes in. The words had hardly been uttered before the servant entered, and said that Mr. Twistle wanted to speak with Mrs. Meredith if she was at home. God bless me! Send him in, said Mrs. Meredith, after the first surprise was over and then, turning to her daughter, she said, "'Talk of what's his name, and you are sure to see some of his friends. If I had wanted him to come, he would not have been here.' "'Very likely, Ma, and yet you do, and he is here.' At this moment Mr. Twistle made his appearance and entered the parlour. Having saluted the ladies, he proceeded to lay his hat and cane upon the table, saying, "'Mrs. Meredith, I dare say you are surprised to see me after so long an absence.' "'My surprise is not greater than my pleasure, Mr. Twistle. I am very glad to see an old friend of my husband's. Pray sit down, sir.' "'Thank you, I will. I am glad to see you look so well. I need not ask how you are, and your amiable daughter, too. She appears charming.' "'Yes, Mr. Twistle, we are in tolerable good health, not often better.' "'Do not let me disturb you, Miss Margaret,' said Mr. Twistle, as she rose to leave the room. "'Oh, no, sir, not at all. I have something to attend to, if you will excuse me.' "'Certainly, certainly. I hope I shall not be any cause of putting you to any constraint and inconvenience. At the same time, I shall not detain Mrs. Meredith long.' "'Oh, we don't intend to lose you suddenly,' said Mrs. Meredith. Anything I can oblige you in, I shall be very happy to do so, if you point out the how. Then I shall proceed to do so at once, said Mr. Twistle. I will do so at once. You see, when your late husband died, or before, he gave me several debts to collect. So I understood, said Mrs. Meredith. Exactly. I see you understand me. Now, those debts I was to collect myself for my own benefit— he, having, when he died, owed me a considerable sum of money. He assigned them to me, and I accepted them as payment of his debt due to me. I understood such to be the case, and at that point the matter was considered as settled, was it not, Mr. Twistle? said Mrs. Meredith. It was so, and is so now, as far as I know now. But I want some few papers which it is possible may be somewhere in your possession, to enable me to secure the payment of them, 
and without these papers I shall not be able to enforce attention. Now I want to know if you will oblige me with them if you have them by you? I will certainly look and make any search I can for them, and if I find them you shall have them, certainly. But, now I have disposed of that, will you do me a favor? Certainly, with pleasure. Well then, Mr. Twistle, you see, there is a certain rich lodger of mine who pays certain attentions to my daughter Margaret, said Mrs. Meredith. I see, said Mr. Twistle. Well, then, he had made no positive offer yet, but we have certain expectations, you see, and in case those expectations become realized, I want to be in such a situation as to know at once what I shall do in such a case, what ought to be done. Very good, my dear madame, very good. Now, we only know from report and from appearances that he is rich. We feel quite convinced of that. He could not well be otherwise, said Mrs. Meredith but we are anxious to know in what kind of stock or property he is likely to have invested it. Yes, I see. Well, then, all you have to do is learn what you can from himself or his friends, and then make inquiries respecting the truth of what you hear. I should be very happy in assisting to make such inquiries, or in any way you may point out. I am very much obliged to you, but, Mr. Twistle, it is a very delicate subject for females to touch upon, and, moreover, it is worse, considering how my daughter is likely to be in connection with him. It is a delicate matter, certainly. Well, now, what I wanted was this. If you would, on some occasion, I would let you know beforehand, call in and take some tea, or whatever meal happened to be at hand, and get into conversation with the colonel, and get this matter from him. Oh, he is a colonel in the army, then? Yes, but returned in bad health from the Indies. He has come only recently. Ay, ay, I see. You have a nabob, I see. That will be a very handsome settlement for your daughter, my dear madame, a very handsome settlement. Yes, it will. Well, it is handsome, but there are drawbacks, you see. Oh, age and ill health. Exactly, they are drawbacks, you see, that are not always to a young female's taste. No, no, but then my daughter is a reasonable young woman, Mr. Twistle, and would not object to a good fortune because there was a kind, though perhaps elderly, gentleman for a husband. Oh, dear no, sir, I have no apprehensions of that character. She will be good and obedient, especially when she knows that it is all for her good. Besides that, you see, the colonel, though an invalid, is not so very old, and is a most pleasant, and I must say, fascinating gentleman to converse with, so that she can have no personal objection. And besides, from what I can observe, I have reason to believe that the colonel is by no means disagreeable to her. Then I am sure it is a very handsome prospect for her, and one that might have been long in happening to one who had a better fortune to aid her. Yes, indeed, it might. Well, then, if I can aid you, command my services. In this respect you may do me much good, but I do not, as it will be some little loss of time to you, desire you should do so for nothing. If we succeed and all is comfortable, you shall have a hundred pounds soon after the marriage, say three months. Very well, I am quite willing to accept the terms, and should I be wanted at any time, perhaps you will let me know as long before as possible. I will do so. And then, when I next come, perhaps you'll be able to hand me the papers, and be ready to sign some agreement which I will get ready for the purpose. Very well, I will do it. I am much obliged to you, said Mr. Twistle. However, I suppose, when I am introduced to the colonel, I am only to come in as an old friend of the family? Exactly so. That will be by far the best character to assume, because you may be anything. Besides which, when matters come to a point proper for interference, you can do so the more easily, and with more effect, and he also will be less inclined to quarrel. And at the same time he can have less objection to do so, which, you see, is a little better. I see, said the attorney, rising. And now, as we have settled this business so far, I will bid you good afternoon, as I have some business elsewhere this evening, which I must get finished. 
After exchanging greetings, the attorney quitted the house of Mrs. Meredith without further remark. End of chapter 131 End of Barney the Vampire, Volume 2 of 3, by Thomas Prescott Prest.